Awesome, I'm gonna spotlight myself here. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Peter. I'm here at the Omaha Zoo. I see a handful of faces of people that I recognize where we've been out to your library and either I've been, or at least we've been the people who email back and forth. So it's excited to, exciting to see some of you again over Zoom. And I'm here today to talk about some of the virtual and even our in-person offerings that we're offering from the zoo for summer reading programs. But you probably noticed you were all watching the sharks that I am here live in the aquarium. I also have a counterpart, Gabby, and she, let's see if I can find her, she is over in the desert. Hey, Gabby. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabby, and I am here in our desert dome. I'm actually standing in front of one of my favorite animals, the Clip Springer. Let me zoom in on her or him. Can't really tell because Clip Springers in East Africa are actually both species, both sexes have horns, but in Southern Africa, only one sex has horn. I'm not for sure where these guys originally came from, but one thing about them is their toes. You guys might notice they're kind of pointed like high heels in that is because these guys live in rocky outcrops and they need to be able to hop and be as agile as possible. That These guys. is Peter? really cool. Gabby, is that a baby? It's so small. Is that a baby clip springer? No, this is a full grown adult. These that, guys don't get very big. That's an adult. That's way smaller than even a baby fawn. You know, I see baby deers. So that's as big as they get. This is as big as they get. That is so because cool. Because of that, they are a prey animal. And you're in the desert dome, Gabby. Do you want to just show us what it looks like if you look up or look around a little bit? Oh, wow. I can see. Yeah, let's see the dome there. Well, the sun's shining right on it, huh? Yep. That is so cool. Gabby, we'll come back to you in a second. I'm going to chat with these librarians a little bit more about the programs we offer. And maybe you can find some more animals around the zoo that we can go have a look at in another minute. All right. Thanks, Gabby. See you soon. All right. So Gabby is going to go find some more animals. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about what we do here um, at the Omaha Zoo for summer reading programs. Uh, I'm the outreach coordinator. And I've been here. I was looking. This is going to be my seventh summer coming up here with the zoo. And I've been the person responsible for those programs since I started. Uh, if you're not sure about oh, the Omaha Zoo, you've not, maybe you're new to the area, we are a nonprofit and a non-governmental. That means all these animals are taken care of based on those ticket sales from when you come and you visit the zoo here. We have 30,000 animals and they all need to be taken care of and fed even when people aren't visiting, even if the zoo has to close again coming up this winter or this spring. We've really put Nebraska on the map in a lot of ways. Um, our zoo is always said in the same breath as zoos like San Diego, which are from much, much, much bigger cities where the world's biggest indoor desert, the largest indoor African elephant holding, the largest rainforest in the Americas and where I'm standing is the largest aquarium inside of a zoo. We're actually bigger than the Sea Life Aquarium down in Kansas City. Uh, we're an AZA accredited zoo and that's really important. It's the gold standard of animal care. It means that we go through a rigorous inspection process from animal care experts from other facilities. Only the top 10% of facilities that are registered to exhibit animals in the country can meet this high standard. Uh, we're also leaders in conservation. All these groups from the AZA are facilities that are dedicated not just to have animals to see, but to help save and protect animals in their native habitats. Not very many zoos reach this level of accreditation because in large part, it's really expensive to take care of animals properly, building high quality animal habitats is not cheap. 
it's a lot cheaper to do things maybe not exactly the right way. So in Nebraska, there are only three accredited facilities. There is our zoo and the safari park, which actually are accredited separately. And then there's also the Lincoln Children's Zoo and the Riverside Discovery Center way out in Scotts Bluff. In Iowa, there's only two. There's the Blank Park Zoo and the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, which I've never been to. I've heard it's pretty cool. There's interestingly enough, there's more in Kansas than Iowa and Nebraska put together. Uh, so I've been putting together programs. My first year, I got started right at the beginning of the summer and found out I was going to a library to talk about superpowers. It was only then that I learned that there's this amazing every summer, a new theme and kids come from all across the country or sorry, all across the region to libraries because I grew up in a city where it wasn't as big of a deal in South Minneapolis. It's been just amazing to me. I've traveled and I've seen more parts of Nebraska and more communities visiting these libraries. We've had turnouts of hundreds and hundreds of people exceeding the population of some towns when we come to visit. And it's just been really great to get to see and be, be a part of Nebraska in this way. Um, last year's assembly theme, I put down there, even though we didn't get to do it, uh, because it really summarizes what we've been working towards. When we first started, it was like, okay, we'll kind of hit the theme a little bit. But over the years, what we've said is, you know what? These are libraries. We want to put together assemblies that utilize characters, utilize storylines and plot, and are theatrical. And that's really made our programs kind of stand out and be unique and different from what other groups are doing. We do still include three small live animals, but they're not the focus of our visits anymore. Um. All right, well, to all names and habitats, and if you think it's a habitat I can live. So this is not a summer library. This is a great video that was put together by the Hastings Tribune of a video we did for a one school, one book presentation on the one and only Ivan. Give me two big thumbs up. But if I name a habitat like, like Nebraska, where it's snowy, what do you think you're gonna do? Are they right, Holly? It is an ape, it's actually a I said Hastings, even though pretty clearly that was Grand Island and not Hastings. Oh, I stopped my presentation. Let's see if we can figure out how to get it back. All right, so, oh, this one's fun. So this year we're plowing ahead, even though, um, even though things have been a little bit crazy, the zoo is closed down. We did put together an assembly program. We have it written out. We have a title. It's gonna be pirate themed for this year. Um, we're gonna have a pirate who stole all of the animals that the expedition club is trying to see. And we're gonna have the kids experience a journey where they learn about different habitats as they try to save the animals from the pirates. Uh, these presentations, the details are probably too small to read in my PowerPoint, but our live assemblies, we travel up to three hours. It's $350 for the first program. And if you need to do two in a row, it's $150 for each additional one when we're already out there. Uh, travel gets a little bit pricey. That's where our, it can end up it's 50 cents a mile after the first 50 miles. 
So it ends up to go to places at the edge of our three hour radius. The maximum price is around $500 for a single program. Um, and stacking with other libraries because we have pretty strict animal care guidelines is not always possible if you're farther out. Uh, but we've also been doing virtual programs since 2002. I know some of you are beyond that three hour radius. It's the only way you have to connect with us. I saw you know, your, this library group goes all the way to North Platte, which is four hours from us and a little too far for us to visit. But we've been doing virtual field trips from on exhibit since it was really hard to do a virtual field trip and groups that we connected to needed to have dedicated T1 lines and H.323 and the technology was all full of crazy numbers and acronyms. That's gotten so much easier since the internet's gotten faster in rural areas and since Zoom. So here is our virtual Hey everyone, field trip. my name is Gabby. Hi, my name's Adam. Hi, this is Holly. Hi, this is Peter. I'm coming to you live from Owen's Sea Lion Shores. The Desert Dome. The Lead Jungle. The African Grasslands. For Scott Aquarium. Expedition to Madagascar. Hey, At Omaha's Henry Dole Zoo and Aquarium. At Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium. Largest aquarium within a zoo. North America's largest indoor rainforest. The world's largest indoor desert. The world's largest geodesic dome. At least 84 Antarctic penguins. He's gonna bring out some. Oh, could happen to a real turtle? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, that's true. Sit down and What's it called when penguins move like this? Oh, oh, All right, so I'm pretty proud of that video that, that we put together this year to try to show schools that what we're doing is a little different than what a lot of places are doing. We really want to not only show the zoo and be in the zoo, not just in a conference room or not just working with the uh, outreach animals that we can handle, but to let people actually come and visit the zoo, but still keep it interactive and not just have it a program like this, where mostly you're interacting through chat or through questioning at the end. When working with kids, we wanna get them engaged doing arm motions, communicating, standing up and waddling, all these things are so important. Uh, we currently have five main offerings and a lot of additional things that we are able to do either on request or that I'm not pushing here. Um, and they're based on the different habitats that we can visit. So it's designed that if you want, you can go through and you can visit all of these different habitats at the zoo from the desert where we just saw Gabby, to the aquarium where I am now, to a penguin exhibit, or even to the rainforest. And speaking of the rainforest, hey, Gabby. Yeah, hold on one sec. There I am. So hey. currently right now, it must be nap time for all our animals <laughs> because it's... everyone I find, they're asleep. So right, well, right now, you're I'm not in the desert friend. anymore, are you, Gabby? No, I am in our rainforest right now. And what it's is that little critter we're looking at? A small clawed otter. Oh, that is oh, look so at that cute. It, that's not the and same kind of otter that we have in Nebraska rivers, is it? No. So this Keep one's found in the rainforest? Yep, in South America. Are they like a beaver? Do they mostly eat bark? No, these guys are carnivores. So otters can live and kind of, look kind of like beavers, but they eat meat, huh? Yep, they are carnivores. And I couldn't help but show you guys our howler monkeys. Here we have one male and two females. You guys might notice they have different colors. The male is the all black one and the females are the light gold one. These guys are really amazing because their grunts and howls can be heard for miles. They're some of South America's loudest animals. 
why would they need to scream so loud that it could be heard from miles away, Gabby? I would, if I heard that some kids could scream so loud it would be heard from miles away, I'd just be worried about the kid. Is that some kind of adaptation that helps out howler monkeys? Yes, these guys are territorial. They don't want any other primate or howler monkey entering their territory. They want to let everyone know, hey, this is my area, stay out. Is there any chance, and I, you might have said it if they were there, but I'm going to ask anyway, is there any chance the tapir is visible down below? Nope. Oh, that's too bad. I can show you our sleeping hippo, though. <laughs> a sleeping hippo? Yeah, let's walk over and take a look at a sleeping hippo. And right now, our sleeping hippo is wallowing. So he or she, has, I'm pretty sure this one is the female, has buried herself inside mud we only can see the top part of her body all the Buried rest of her legs in yep. mud whoa that that big blump bump there that's the hippo yes yeah, so this is a tiny hippo it's not as big as their african counterpart these guys are about 50 percent smaller but small for a hippo still 800 pounds Whoa, that is very big. And yeah, the common hippos, Gabby, those live in the African savannas, the wetlands off the savannas. So this pygmy hippo, does it normally live in the rainforest like this? Yes, it does. It and does. there's, you know, the ones, the common hippo live in huge, huge groups of hundreds of hippos. Is this one supposed to be by itself? Yes, these guys aren't as friendly as the African counterparts. They prefer to live alone. So this is by itself on purpose. Are these, are there a lot of these in the wild, Gabby, or is this an endangered species? This is an endangered species. So that's probably so, why a lot of people haven't heard of them is that they're much less common than the common hippo. I guess the name kind of makes sense, huh? <laughs> yep, these guys are called pygmy hippos. Yeah, and they're critically endangered. Thank yep. you so much, Gabby, for showing us a little more of the rainforest. If, if you want to find somewhere else, let me know. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. And we can tune in right at the very end. And maybe you can help with some questions. All right. See you guys soon. So Gabby is showing off a couple different areas. Typically, we're pretty stationary with our big nice camera. I've got this camera here in the aquarium that lets me go and look not just at the shark tank, but I can zoom in on any of these animals around and go up closer and get a much nicer and clearer view. So we're hosting these from pretty nice equipment. And then we also will use our cell phones or other tablets and devices like Gabby is to let us be more mobile where we can't get this big cart with our high quality camera. These jellyfish um, are not actually fish, which is weird because they have fish in their name, but they are a west coast sea nettle and we, they look gorgeous and brightly colored. But if you've been to the ocean, jellies are really hard to see. The reason they're so bright and colorful is because we have special lighting that makes them bright and colorful jellies can go up they can go down but they can't go side to side that's how they end up getting washed up on beaches and they're a sign of oceans being unhealthy after you take away all the fish or and after farming runoff gets into the ocean we end up getting huge blooms of jellyfish because they're eating the other kinds of plankton over here, I know you all, I gave you all a nice look at our shark tank before, but this tank we're looking at is the centerpiece of probably our whole zoo, um, definitely of our aquarium. It's 450,000 gallons of water that you can see, including the shark tunnel that runs through it, and then another 450,000 gallons of water in filtration so that we don't have to take all the fish out and put them into bags. Uh, that big fish down there is a grouper and swimming by is one of our six foot long 200 pound sandbar sharks. Gonna jump back over to my PowerPoint here.
basically what I what I found on the beach. And show you a little Check. bit of some of the interactive elements that we do with kids. Believe what I what I found on the beach. Check it out. I know I found all of them and I kept them here in my treasure chest. But it turns out some of the things that I found on the beach were not supposed to be in the ocean. They were trash. So I'm going to need your help. I'll pull something out of this bin. And I want you to tell me out loud if you think that what I have in here is trash or if it's treasure. Got it? So treasure is stuff that's supposed to be in the ocean. Trash are things that are not supposed to be in the ocean. Let's see. Let's open the treasure chest. Oh, my gosh. Ooh, let's see. The first thing I found was this. What do you think? Should this be in the ocean? Yeah, this is absolutely treasure. Look at that. That is a shell. How about this plastic bottle here? Okay. Trash or treasure? Trash. trash. Yuck. Definitely trash. What about this weird thing? Treasure. Really? What do you think it is? I don't know. Definitely not a rock. And you definitely don't have them in Wisconsin, except maybe at the supermercado. The shell? This is a coconut. Oh, oh wait, that's a coconut? Yeah. This is what a coconut looks like after it falls off the tree. The ones you get at the store have the husk peeled off. But this coconut would, is a big seed, and it would float on the water plant itself on a beach, and a coconut tree would grow right out of this seed. That's cool. Yes. That's super cool. Hey, what about these up at the top of the tower? Okay. These goggles, and there were bottles. What are all oh, I'm just skip ahead there. I couldn't quite get it to... um. Couldn't quite get that to, to skip to the conservation message because we use that trash or treasure to teach kids about reducing, reusing, and recycling. Uh, instead of doing what I have in this presentation here for penguins, I wanted to try something with you. This is a clip just to show that we are live and on exhibit. There's me getting the penguins to follow and chase me during a quiet day when there weren't a lot of people. But I wanted to show you something here that's pretty cool because this is the, we do a few videos in our programs and this is my favorite one of all. This is a penguin regurgitating to its young. It took me years before I got to see this. The penguin watch, it goes tap, tap, tap with its beak on the mom. And then eventually she's gonna regurgitate or throw up some fish right into her baby's belly. I got this live during a virtual field trip and I couldn't believe it because I'd spent years trying to see them do this. They don't do it very often when the public's around and when you can see. Oh, so tasty, but not safe during COVID. But you know what? I noticed something. I noticed that those penguins were in a really cold snowy environment, but they weren't wearing coats. And so I've got Penelope the penguin here. And what I did is I grabbed a sweater because she looked so cold. And I heard that maybe I could make a sweater and I could warm up all my penguins. Do you, do you librarians think I should keep my penguin in a sweater and go put sweaters on all those penguins out there? No, okay. Well, then I've got a question for you because everyone's nodding no, of course not, even though she looks absolutely adorable. But, and that's because penguins have something on their body that keeps them warm. And I wonder, oh my gosh, how did I not see this? Look, there's a big turtle right up there talking about something else. And then I get distracted because there's a huge loggerhead sea turtle right above my head. That is a 300 pound loggerhead sea turtle. Uh, her name's Harold because we didn't know she was a girl when she was first rescued 
because of that bright yellow color she is and brought to our zoo. If we're lucky, she'll swim down and we can get a closer look. When she's up there, she's kind of stuck in the light. So here's my question to you about penguins. Do you think, and this is something, if you've got your camera on, I'll know what you're thinking. Um, you can also type in your answer in the chat if you're bold enough to answer. I wanna know if you think that penguins are covered in feathers, like the feather of this blue and gold macaw. If you think, no way, they're not covered in feathers, they're covered in fur like this polar bear claw, or if you think that they're covered in both fur and feathers. And the way you're gonna answer is with your arms. If you think they're covered in feathers, you're gonna reach up and touch the sky. If you think they're covered in fur, you're gonna reach down and touch the floor. And if you think they're covered in both, you're gonna put your hands in the middle on your shoulders. Let's see what answers we have from the librarians. And I'm seeing a lot of you who do what all the kids do too. I ask this to groups of teachers and adults and I get, everyone wants to pick both, but penguins are birds and birds are covered in feathers. Angela and the rest of you who got that right can give yourself a pat on the back, nicely done. And I brought with me some penguin feathers. Check it out. This is a teeny tiny penguin feather. The reason it looks like they're covered in fur is because they have more feathers than almost any other bird forming a really thick mat. This feather is hard to see, so I also have with me a microscope. Let's cut over to the microscope. And you can see I washed my hands for this, but no matter how many times I wash my hands, it always looks dirty under the microscope. And then let's have a look at what this penguin feather looks like under the microscope, check this out. The reason it looks kind of like fur is that it has so many of these barbels to keep it warm. And then the penguin on the end has an oil gland that'll make it waterproof. That looks really different than this feather, which is from the macaw. Which, and this is a flight feather Remember, it was gold on the one side and it's blue on the other. Um, what's in the aquarium or in the rainforest? Our virtual field trips work if you're in person or at home. Um, they're harder when it's a mix, but we've come up with a lot of really great strategies to engage kids and adults both at home and in person. Uh, so a lot of my VFTs look like this. We prefer Zoom, but I'm comfortable with whatever software you have. I present quite a bit on Teams and Google Meet, but I've also done WebEx and GoToMeeting. Uh, the cost is currently at $125. We are in talks about raising that because it's so much work for us to set up a hardwired connection where we're not upset by the Wi-Fi when we're busy to be on grounds. Uh, right now, our maximum is 50 people. Last summer, we didn't have a single library with more than 50 connections. If you think yours might have it, talk to me about it. That's not a firm limit. Uh, but the idea is we keep that lower because it's a program for just your community. What we don't want is you know, an, one that's gonna have hundreds of kids from all over connecting. We wanna keep it personal. I like keeping it on two Zoom screens. That's why we have 50 as the limit. Um, we schedule them at your convenience. So if your programs are at a 10 o'clock or a noon or a three o'clock time slot, we can accommodate that. Uh, and they last about an hour. These are designed for kindergarten through eighth grade because of the, the content level we're hitting because they're not just a passive look at the animals program. Preschoolers do enjoy them, but they their attention span wavers a little bit more. And we have not had a lot of success with below preschool. The two and three year olds seem to kind of just run away and we lose them off the screen. Um, we also offer adult programs. If you have an adult lunch group where we talk about other themes in conservation or just do a more passive, here's a tour of the aquarium. Another option is we with the Omaha Public Library this summer, we did some virtual story times 
and we can offer those where either um, you'll come in and read the book and we'll help you set up the hardware around at our zoo. It's a lot harder than you think to get a good internet connection, good lighting and see animals. And then we'll also talk about the animals and you can read your book. If you're farther away, you can let us know what book it is and we can also do the reading of the book for you. These are a little more expensive because the coordination factor does take quite a bit more time and energy and we tend to present in different areas we don't usually present because if your story is about say um, a giraffe, we present in a giraffe area, which isn't one of our normal presentation spots. And those are suitable for all ages. So if you have very little ones, it's a good way to incorporate those very little ones as well. Um, and at that price point, we can probably accommodate um, a two person tour like I'm doing with Gabby, where we'll have one person in a studio and one person walking around showing the zoo. If you want something capture something more expensive, we do also offer virtual backstage tours. These were designed as kind of a higher end program. Uh, so they're $350 and there's three exhibits where the zookeepers take you on a backstage tour. Um, it's either elephants, gorillas, or the aquarium. Um, and those, those capture hundred connections. Their movement. And if they would lift their foot up a little bit, and they we do would look at areas that aren't normally give them visible. a treat and be like, oh, that's what we would wanted you. Th those are designed because they come from zookeepers presenting. They tend to be a little bit higher level content, but we have had a lot of younger people watch and just passively enjoy watching them because they are a little bit more of a tour. Um, my contact information is right here. If you're interested in contacting me, you can sign up for the virtuals at the on our website at omahazoo.com slash virtual field trips. You can email me to sign up for any of the assemblies or other programs. Oh. And gosh, I, I thought I saw Harold. Oh, there she is. <laughs> there is that big turtle. Um, and if you have questions, if you're not sure what's going to happen with your library this summer, we're fine with you scheduling a program. We don't charge a deposit on any of this. So it makes it really easy if you have to shut down or cancel for COVID uh, because we're not gonna charge you a deposit and have to worry about all the craziness of rescheduling. I'm a couple minutes late. Do we have any questions from anyone? Do we have time for questions, Tammy? Yeah, I think that would be fine. All right, so if you have a question, you can um, uh, can I send my email address? Yes, I will share that last slide. Uh, this is the easier email address. I do also have a personal email address, which is peter.brunette at omahazoo.com. Uh, I don't put that up just because most people can't spell the hair color brunette. They, they spell it wrong but you're a librarian, so I trust you're probably really good at spelling. Um, Peter, it looks like we have a few questions in yep. the chat. Yeah, I saw that one, Gabby, thanks. Um, ideal size for classroom style event. Uh, I feel like once it gets above about 50 people and starts turning into an assembly, it's really tricky because we, we're fun, we're engaging, but it's not, an assembly. So if you've got um, the virtuals, we try to, we, even in person, I think 50 is a good limit. Uh, the backstage tours are about an hour. Uh, as far as in-person assemblies, those ones where we come out, the, the maximum for that is 200. And that's because our animals are not big animals. The big animals live here at the zoo. They can't be transported easily away. And if I'm showing a box turtle to more than 200 people, they're not going to see it. Um, so yeah, if you have it in the library, sorry, I didn't realize how many parts there were to that question. If you have the event in the library, then uh, really the best place is going to be uh, a conference room or the big space. The trick is getting a good projector and audio. If you don't have a good audio system, 
they're not going to hear. So you got to have really big loudspeakers. And that's where we've had a couple groups fail is they think they can use just the speakers off the librarian's desk or off the teacher's desk. And that's just not loud enough because you have to be louder than the kids. Oh, there's the elephants. Gabby's down by the elephants, huh? Yep, I am. Right now, these guys are eating quite a bit. They are having some enrichment with those holes in the wall. We hide some food in there and they have to go dig through and find it. That is so cool. Yeah, it's elephants programs do work better in the winter than the summer because they don't go outside when it's 40 degrees out and they like to be outside more when it's warmer. We give them the choice though. On a day like this, the doors open. They usually go outside. They have to see for themselves that it's too cold. They don't take our word for it. Well, am I, did I miss any other questions? Did I get all the questions that were there? How long is the backstage tour? Did you oh, answer I got that, that one? one? It's about an hour. Okay. They're all about an hour. We can adjust. The story times ended up going a lot shorter when we were doing them. Um, but it's also, if you want us to do, those can be a little more of a combination where there's the book plus a little bit longer virtual. Or they can be, hey, we read a book about elephants. Here's an elephant and a few animal facts like Gabby just did. They, they really are based on what your library is looking for. <laughs> Thank you all so much for letting me be a part of this. And thank you to those of you who've had us out to your libraries before I was looking through, there were half a dozen of you where we visited the libraries. So really exciting to at least see your names, even if I didn't see your faces again. Thanks, Tammy. And thank you, Gabby, for running halfway across the zoo <laughs> three separate times so that we could see the elephants. That is a long walk from the jungle. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Are you ready to start, Sally? Yes, I can start to share my screen and then um, let's see. Okay, where are you? Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay. Do you see the Library Commission homepage up there? Okay. So just a quick how to find my list if you don't have a copy yet. If you go to the Library Commission main page, type in handout. Some of you have heard me say this a number of times. Then the top thing is Nebraska Library Commission handouts. And this is the handout for the presentation of the whole list that I did for Encompass Live a couple Wednesdays ago. So you can click on this and you will get the entire list. I'm only gonna talk about about approximately half of the books today. And um, that's because we're trying to get lots of different things for you today. So I'm gonna talk about some of them, but you can also, if you're interested, go to the Encompass Live archive to see the entire presentation that's been saved there if you're interested or if you just want to zoom through to find that particular book you're curious about and hear me talk about that. So let's go to this and let's see what happens when I do this. No. Okay. I want it the other way. So let's see. Let's see if I can do, wait, no, wait, <laughs> there, no. <laughs> oh, no, that's interesting. It's given me more trouble than I expected. Don't worry, we'll get it in a minute. Well, okay, stop sharing. Now I'm gonna share my other screen. Okay, now do you see the PowerPoint 
Tales and Tales, um, 2021 SRP. Okay. I'm going to talk really fast. And I'm just going to say that the books that are on this list are ones either that I um, got here at the Library Commission as review books, or they were ones I saw at the public library. And I'm going to talk as fast as I can because I don't want to hold you up too much from the time frame we got started with. So we'll start with, um, there we go, fiction picture books. Little Donkey Loves Grass Best. It tastes so good and it's crunchy and juicy. Mom tries to get him to eat some other foods, but no, he will have nothing to do with those. Then one day he sees his reflection in the pond and he is green. Ah! He finally tries some other food, but each is kind of yuck and bleh and until he tries a carrot. Carrots are delicious. Guess what happens next? Lammy is fast and she can catch any chicken in their compound in Nigeria. But one day she takes too great of a risk. She chases a chicken up into the branches of a tree. When she grabs for the chicken, she falls and hurts her ankle. It's too much for her to chase chickens for a while. And that is when she learns there is more than one way to catch a chicken. An irritated koala named Warren is adamant about the fact that koalas are not bears. As a matter of fact, Warren notes that Australia does not have any bears at all, except in the zoo, of course. His efforts appear to be in vain though. Aaron Blabby is very popular and with that koala's expression right there, I think that book will go right off the shelf. Samson loves to make other animals happy. However, every time he is on his way to someone's party, he is too late to have a piece of cake or play games. He is slow, but also he stops to chat with the tree frog, stop the monkeys from arguing, and turn the tortoise back on his feet. So he decides this time he's going to hurry. He doesn't stop for anybody, and he is still late. His friends come up with a plan. They invite him to a party, and he gets there on time. I bet you know how they did that. This is a sequel to Can I Be Your Dog? Arfie finds a homeless kitten and, reminiscent of the first book, writes letters to people on the block, asking them to adopt Scamper. The kitten wa walks each letter up to the door, and on the next page is a person's reply about how it won't work. Who will adopt Scamper? Very sweet, like the first book. Jim is a boy and notices that people and their dogs go together because either their names rhyme or they look like each other. But in the rescue shelter, Mr. Scruff has no one. Jim and Mr. Scruff do not look alike and their names do not rhyme, but maybe they belong together. It's a fun take on finding your dog and on how people connect with their pets. Fort Robinson in Western Nebraska was used to train dogs during World War II. This story from the viewpoint of one of the dogs gives a, gives a sense of the training they received and the duties the dogs performed in war. In Major's case, he returned home and was retrained to be a family dog before returning to his family. The last four pages give good nonfiction information about the training center and Major. Four photographs are included as well as a copy of Major's honorable discharge paper, which is pretty neat. You may have seen this book before or you may already have it, it is based on a true story. Jessica was hurt and one lower leg needed to be amputated. And she was working on learning to walk with it when she uh, met a service dog. So she signed up to get one. Meanwhile, Rescue was learning how to be a service dog. Once they were paired up, it was amazing. But then Jessica had to have the lower part of her other leg amputated. They worked together to learn the new things they needed to know. It's a fictionalized story of the author who was injured in the Boston Marathon bombing and her service dog, Rescue. Additional information is at the back of the book. This is so fun. A gray cat wakes up and jumps out of a pile of cats announcing, welcome to that magical time when everybody says meow. He gets five meows and one woof from a dog leaning into the scene. After he discovers that the dog can only say woof, he announces, new plan. Everybody say meow, one guy say woof. He gets a loud meow, one woof and a ribbit. And then later there's a duck. And then finally, the cat figures it out and he says, welcome to that magical time where everybody says whatever they want. And they do. There's a fun surprise at the end when they hear a roar. Inclusive and accepting of different sounds and different animals. I liked his 
going with the flow. Let's just celebrate everybody. Three kittens have climbed everything worth climbing on their island. What's next? Going to Dinosaur Island and climb dinosaurs. The narrator tries to discourage them, but they are into their covered floating litter box and off to the island. They run into some snakes and end up trying plan D because the other plans didn't work. The book ends with a new challenge, climbing mommy sores. This book has lots of planning, they're goal oriented and they are determined or you could say stubborn, but they're so cute and fuzzy. <laughs> oh yes, he is one mean ant. But one day he's so angry, he marches off and he's grumbling and grumbling until he realizes he is lost. After much blame tossing, a fly comes along and gives him a ride. Watch out for that spider web. Oh, book two. Ant and fly are stuck in a spider web. Flea is there too, having just escaped from a flea circus. Fortunately, flea can hop and hop and bounce all of them out of the web. Fly gives both of them a ride, but he is headed the wrong way. Soon, they are all three back in the flea circus. I sure hope there's a book three because how are they gonna get out of that? Do we only have the two so far. Some picture book nonfiction. It's, this is an ecology book about the impact sea otters have on their environment. It recounts a disaster that occurred after the sea otter was hunted almost to extinction. The sea urchins numbers grew to the point that they destroyed miles of kelp forest, which impacted many other species. Beautiful art and clear explanations convey the issue and the lives of otters. Sea otters. Each two page spread features one or two animals and one thing a zookeeper might do for that animal. Everything from brushing a hippo's teeth to picking up panda poop. Listeners will be intrigued by some of the more unusual duties like using a rake to gently scratch a taper's back. This is just as it sounds, a look at various baby animals and how they play. The author demonstrates how play helps prepare the baby animal for life as an adult. For the winter, the Arctic fox heads north to the top of the world. As spring comes, she turns again and heads south for the summer. It's an amazing journey of anywhere from 1,700 to 2,000 miles every year. Beginning readers, little penguin is very excited about the new visitor soon to arrive, a polar bear. His friends have heard some bad things about polar bears, like they have sharp teeth, they're mean hunters, and they tell very bad jokes. But little penguin is willing to wait and see because you should not believe everything you hear. He remembers that his best friend Franklin is called a killer whale. When the boat arrives, a polar bear gets off. She has sharp teeth, but she is laughing. That's not scary. But then she tells a couple of bad jokes. If it is true that polar bears tell bad jokes, is it true that they are mean hunters? Making new friends, being skeptical of rumors, and welcoming a visitor. This is book three about the, the pig, the fox, and the fox. I haven't seen the other two titles. In this one, fox loves to trick pig. In the first story, he builds a high wall and places the doll on top. Pig sees it and hurries to get fox off the wall, tripping and accidentally knocking it down. He catches the doll, but the real fox was caught in the cascading pile of blocks. And the next two stories kind of carry that theme through continuing the trick and getting hurt. This is a one, this is so fun. Three stories. The first one starts with see the cat and the dog says, I am not a cat, I am a dog. The next page, see the blue cat. And the dog says, I am not blue and I am not a cat. It, this continues until the dog gets quite frustrated and angry when from behind him comes a blue cat in a green dress riding a pink unicorn. Oh, says the dog. So there's three stories all together. Again, it's humor, a couple of surprise twists. And it's kind of a spoof of classic primers, but it also is in itself a classic primer. Um, I think there's three books about the frog, frog and frogs and dog, if I can turn my page here. Dog wants to play with the three frogs, but he keeps falling down. They send him away, but soon there is a bear. <laughs> kind of panic. Dog keeps his head and uses one of the moves he, moves he couldn't do right earlier, and he defeats the bear. Problem solving, keeping one's head, very brief text and repetition will bring in new readers. And the next book is about a goat in a boat, where it's raining. Uh, dog didn't think it was going to rain, so he did not get in the boat, and now he's getting wet. 
some early chapter books. Amazon says this is book one of nine. I've only seen this first one. This is book one. Zoe is surprised to see that one of her mom's photos glows purple. Her mom tells her that she helps magical animals that live in the nearby forest. And now, since her mom will be gone for a week, Zoe can help them since she is the first person her mom has found that can also see the creatures. A few days later, a baby dragon is left by the secret door in the barn. Zoe uses a scientific method which her mother taught her to try to find out what is wrong and what will help. Sassafras the cat is very much part of everything Zoe does. And during the night, Sassafras responds to the need the dragon has that Zoe missed. This puppy had two bad homes before, before finding himself at a rescue shelter. When a boy comes along to adopt him, the puppy is afraid and doesn't know what he should do. Barking and some other things puppies do got him in trouble before. This is about family, caring for an animal, and moving toward the future, all dealt with here. And also music is involved in the, in the story as well. Diary of a Pug, this is book one. Bub loves peanut butter and his girl, Bella. But sometimes Bub is in the wrong place at the wrong time. How did he end up on the rocket Bella was blasting into the sky? And how will he get the broken wing part back from Nuts the Squirrel? Peanut butter? School is closed and Bella can't wait to go out and play. Bub does not like snow or cold. Plus, the new neighbor has a monster-sized pet. He loves Bella though. Will Pug go outside? This is great silliness. A full color graphic novel format, a master of disguise, not really, Agent Moose of Woodland High HQ is called to find a missing witness, Ter Terrence Turtle. He is miffed that Camo Chameleon just solved his 100th case and a big party is being thrown for him. Agent Moose has solved 99 cases. He and his sidekick, Alfred, follow the clues and eventually learn why Terrence the Turtle disappeared and who has been holding him captive. Again, it has a good mystery and it is silly fun. This is part of a series that was originally published in England. Jasmine and her younger brother Manu live on a farm with their parents. Their mom is a veterinarian and their dad runs the farm. On one day, Jasmine went with her mother on a call to a neighboring farm and she discovers a small runt piglet that couldn't suckle. So she snuck it away back to her house. Well, it is soon discovered and Jasmine has done such a good job taking care of it that she's allowed to keep it. Her phone call to the farmer confessing her trick is a very good lesson for her. The piglet Truffle is smart and soon learns some helpful tasks. And there are um, at least six books so far in this series, the second one being A Duckling Called Button. This is the second book about McTavish. I haven't seen the first one. It was titled Good Dog McTavish. In this one, it, we become aware that McTavish believes his job is to help his family to connect with each other. They seem to think he should follow their commands. Ha. So he runs away to a lovely lake and forest area so they will follow, get some exercise, and relax in nature. Now we have fiction for grades two to five or so. Olive met Maudie, her older half-sister, two weeks before their father died of cancer. Now an orphan, Olive lives with Maudie. Since they are adjusting, they had to move, and Maudie has a new job. Getting a job, getting a dog will have to wait until Olive learns about raising a puppy to later be trained to be a guide dog. Olive is determined to do it right and she gets lots of support. A sweet positive puppy story that also includes family changes, a potential disaster, and adjusting to a new school in a new town. Letty Out Loud is also wonderful. Letty Munoz, it's the summer right after fifth grade, she, she has been learning English because Spanish is her first language and she is still shy about speaking English with um, English speakers. She and some of her friends are helping at an animal shelter for the summer. Letty signs up to write descriptions of pets available, but so has Hunter, who is a bit of a bully. It's about finding homes for pets, being yelled at for speaking Spanish in a grocery store, and practicing English. It all comes together well for what will happen next story. This book did receive a 2020 Pura Belpre Award, honor book, I mean, honor award, sorry. Full color graphic novel, Trot and Captain Bill, a cat, surf together. One day when Trot was grounded, they crept out of the house to make, try to get in a couple of rides. They capsize and Trot gets hit on the head from the surfboard. Before they know it, they both have gone far enough under the sea 
to encounter the sea sirens or mermaids and learn about their conflict with the serpents. The sea sirens are fascinated with Captain Bill and make it possible for Trot to hear what he is saying. This has a Vietnamese American main character, the ever surprising Captain Bill, help, and both of them helping to resolve a dispute that can end in, in a peaceful understanding and helping to care for a grandfather with dementia. While this storyline is completed by the end of the book, the last line in the book is to be continued. So I expect some more. This is a full color graphic novel also. Katya is in grade school and she and her Mima have returned to spend the summer at their Alaskan cabin. Katya loves to read comic books and is not interested in the outdoors or making friends. So Mima sends her to the corner market for a snack and some time outside. Coming back, Katya accidentally falls off the log crossing the ravine and finds herself face to face with a Kodiak bear, which is not something you want. But he is gentle and non-threatening and his hind leg is trapped under a log. She gets Mima and they lift the log using some rope and Mima's scooter. And he goes home with them so Mima can tend his wounds. And he and Katya become wonderful friends. But Katya and Mima have to return early to Seattle. So Cody, who is just what she named the bear, finds a way to follow and try and find them in Seattle. I read an, an advanced reader's copy, so there might be a few little differences in the final book, but generally they're pretty similar. When their owner, Mrs. Food, is taken to the hospital after a fall in the kitchen, the pets are sure they will have to go to the pound. But then they find out that one of the other tenants of the building likely has a stash of gold coins. And so heist planning ensues because they can steal the coins, they can buy food and stay in the house. Clever, humorous, thoughtful, Animal loving children will grab this book off the display. Kizzy has always hoped for and wanted a pony. One day in the grocery store with her best friend Paul, there was a pony eating donuts. Kizzy claimed him, quietly took him up the elevator to her family's apartment and decided that one night like that was all she could handle. Paul offered the shed in his backyard since his parents would be gone for a week. That worked for that week, but now what to do? How to care for a pony, feed and clean up after it, with just a little time for riding is the formula that results in Kizzy walking the pony back to the riding stable he came from. But another surprise is in store. It's about responsibility and sharing and finding the right solution. Two Dogs in a Trench Coat, there are four books I think on this in this series. This is the first one. Waldo and Sassy are good dogs, keep the squirrels out of the yard and try every day to keep their people home, but they can't succeed. Lately, the dogs have noticed that their boy Stuart is not happy with school. They accidentally find an old trench coat and a new plot is hatched. They will go to school as a new student named Salty, find out why Stuart is unhappy. The dog's point of view as to what is good about school will make readers laugh and their positive attitude plus sometimes helpful efforts encourage Stuart to work on his dreaded big report and give his presentation to the class. This is a sequel to George and the Stolen Sunny Spot from 2016, but it's not necessary to have read the first one. George, the cat in the circle there, continues to be frustrated with Felix since Felix, the new cat, does not see the need to patrol the farm and protect the animals. When Emma, their person, brings home a box with chicks and one Muscovy duckling, George is baffled. Who needs them? Unexpectedly, the duckling imprints on George and she follows him everywhere. But over time, George realizes the duckling, whom he calls Kid, is very good at patrolling and guarding. The coyote old mangy is on the edges of the farm and things come to a head soon enough. Good thing Kid is on the team. It's great fun and that duckling is a hoot. This is a, by a Nebraska author and publisher. When Melly and her friend Danny find a stinky bedraggled cat behind the local pet food factory, Melly takes him home and names him Bert. Bird is unusual. He bites the heads off of Melly's dolls, doesn't like cat food, and soon they are calling him Zombird because he seems like a zombie cat. This slightly spooky story is brief, but readers will learn Zombird's, <coughs> excuse me, Zombird's mission is to save the other animals at the pet food factory. There is a cliffhanger ending. I'm going to speed up. Harvey comes home. It's set in Canada. Harvey is a Westie and he accidentally gets out of the yard when his family is on vacation. He was after a squirrel. He's found by Austin, a boy volunteering in a retirement home where his grandfather works. But Harvey is the key that unlocks Mr. Pickering, who's been kind of feisty and, and grumpy. And Mr. Pickering starts to tell Austin a lot of stories about 
his youth. And uh, it makes an interesting combination of caring about the dog and sharing his life. So it, this book covers respect for others, caring for a dog. People have great stories inside them and doing the right thing. And the paperback comes out in April. There's a, a sequel called Harvey Holds His Own. And this this the first book in a series of three um, for her 11th birthday, Grammy lets Birdie choose a dog from the shelter. She picks a big one and names him Bowser. These books are told from Bowser's point of view and some of his thoughts are hilarious. They have to solve a mystery in each story. In this first one, they need to figure out who stole the prize stuffed Marlin out of Grammy's bait and swamp tour shop and why. This is set in small town Louisiana on the bayou. There are, it is fun and there are some unusual characters. There's an interesting mystery and it's a good start to the next three books, which are interestingly named Arf and Bow Wow. Oh, oh yes. This is, takes place in Lexington, Nebraska. Lexington is 12 and she doesn't remember anything before the tornado came through Lexington, Nebraska, after which she was found with an elephant at the local zoo. Roger, the zoo train specialist, took her in and he wants to adopt her, but he's hesitating because she still thinks she can find her family. There's a lot of things happening this summer that are new for her, it's a, but it's a wonderful story. It's a, about a, a good sense of place. Lex is working through a few issues along with the mystery and Lex is loved and cherished. And there's a bit of magic realism in there too. Cyrus is in sixth grade. When he was a baby, he was left by the firehouse door and taken in by Brooks Olson, the only one who could calm him. His father is a well-respected firefighter. Cyrus is proud of him, but feels he himself could never be brave like that. 11 years later, a puppy is left by the same door and Cyrus knows it should be his dog, but the puppy is at the pound now. So he skips football practice to go and help walk the pound puppies, one of them being the puppy he thinks he should have. He makes friends with the girls who do this. And he thinks about how he and his friends who love tackle football, they're not on the same page anymore. He liked, um, flag football, but he doesn't like tackle. He's not brave like that. Lying to his father and his coach is not going to work for long. This is again a, a full color graphic novel. Melly Bean digs a hole in the backyard and suddenly falls through it to another world. He encounters a very large orangey creature and wants to play. Unfortunately, the large creature named Nara is almost constantly under attack by the king's soldiers. Melly Bean's steady optimism helps Nara decide to find a way to end the conflict. It's a positive, do the right thing, upbeat story, and Melly Bean always looks enthusiastic. Uh, quick zoom through the nonfiction. This is a sequel to Lesser Spotted Animals from 2019. And this, uh, they, show, they show a two page spread for each animal you may never have heard of, give some basic information about them, and uh, this could send the reader off to research more information about those animals. This is another ecology book where it talks about 70 years, the Yellowstone National Park did not have wolves, their apex predator. And this pro title provides insight into the changes the park went through those 70 years and how it has changed again once wolves were reintroduced. This is a two, well, three page on each animal it describes one of 13 well-known animals by listing several features of it. The descriptions are usually in terms of inanimate objects such as marbles or a fire hose or fly paper. And the reader want, they want the reader to guess before they open that flap that, that shows what the animal really is. It's very entertaining and it's a new way to see animals. And you could challenge your students or patrons to try their hand at this kind of description with some animals that aren't in the book. Each two page spread contains a file on one of 13 animals who are bandits, tricksters, deceivers, or spit on you when irritated. Don't worry, Detective X is on the case. It's upbeat, silly fun, but it still contains true information. And just a couple teen titles, I'll go real quick. Lydia 13 has just lost her mother. Her father left them six years ago, and now she goes to rural Connecticut to live with her aunt Brat and Brat's wife, Eileen. A rescue dog is added to the family a few days later, and this dog, Guffer, has problems. Is Lydia a problem too, she wonders? This is a muted full color graphic novel. Two cats are looking for the door that opens into the lovely garden, or they will never have to worry again. Beto is skeptical and explains that the door is just a kitten story, but Scylla is a believer and Beto follows her where she goes to find this door. 
the, the basic story is entertaining, but the other interesting thing is the author illustrator encompasses famous works of art throughout the book with the cats walking through them at times. She alters the paintings a bit to fit the story, but each one is identified at the back of the book. It's beautiful and unusual. Then I have a couple of uh, nonfiction uh, scientists in the field, one about condors and one about the Tasmanian devil. And then my final book is for older readers. Adelaide, it's the summer before her senior year. She is on the, in high school, she is on the academic probation at Alabaster Prep where her father teaches. Her mother and brother Toby, he's an opioid addict, are in Boston where he is getting treatment. Her summer job is to feed and walk several teachers' dogs as they are away for the summer. So that's the dog connection. But this um, story tells a number of incidents in three or more different um, act, act, things happen differently. It's like three different realities. And as you read it, you kind of can see how this reality is following along by the typeface that's used and the uh, um, how they position the words, you can figure out which story is which one. And it's an interesting look at a girl's life this summer, where she is now and where she may end up going. And thank you. Sorry I over went over. Thank you, Sally. Sorry you had a late start and had to rush through it. That's OK. I have to figure out how to quit. OK. I close the window so screen sharing has stopped. Awesome. Thank you, Sally. Cool. Okay, we'll take a break until about a quarter after two, and then we'll meet with Moral Hall here. So go get refreshment or whatever you need to do for the next 10 minutes. So welcome, Annie. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Let me get my view here so I can do it well. I am, I'm working, I'm kind of handicapped, just like you. I'm working from home, I meant to be in. Oh, here we go. I can't find my. I don't mean to be pausing, but I have to find my, um, I can't find my uh, mouse. Let's see. You started recording too soon, Tammy. I'm not quite ready. <laughs> All right, something has happened here. I'm frozen, so I'm gonna have to crash out. So, cause I, I can't I can't operate. So I don't know why not. Let me try something okay. here. Well, let me try this. Oh, I'm back. Am I good? Yes, all, right. all good. Okay, here, let me do this. All right, Matt. This is a good example of making it work for you, right? <clears throat> all right. Please give me a thumbs up. Can you hear me? All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Annie Mumgard. I am a, the virtual learning coordinator at the University of Nebraska State Museum, commonly known as Merle Hall, on the campus of UNL. Um, I have a feeling if I look through the screen here, I might recognize many of you. Um, I was really uh, uh, pleasantly surprised and honored that Tammy asked me to speak with you today. Um, I am going to start with a bit of a disclaimer in that um, I meant to be speaking to you from the museum. The museum is open and um, is a great place to come visit. <clears throat> We're very clean, we have to wear a mask. It's uh, actually quite a safe place to come if you're looking for a way to get out of the house. Um, but um, I'm one of those classic folks that I have a daughter who came home from college. She's kind of been living a saintly life, came, did her traveling and in her travels came home and tested positive. So now I'm quarantining at home. So I am uh, trying to talk to you um, without all of my tools. And um, I think that probably should feel, sound familiar to most of you that this last year probably feels like we've all been cut off from our tools. And so what I decided to talk about with you today is not only what we have to offer, um, for I know you're looking at 
planning your summer programming, but also kind of like how to re envision your tools and what might tools you might need to help you plan in this kind of world that's been turned a little bit upside down and maybe forced some of us into being more technical than we um, ever thought we would need to be or could be. So um, we have a saying that we're not going to waste a good crisis. And that's kind of what we've been trying to do all along here. So <clears throat> I'm going to share real quick. Um, when I do a virtual field trip, I uh, always like to start with, let me make sure I get the right one here, um, that, this is funny, um, always start with that, trying to give context of where we are. So I get, get, get my PowerPoint up here to make sure I get the right one. And let's put that in the slideshow. <clears throat> so um, again, it's one of those funny things where you get to watch me kind of fumble around, but it's, uh, somebody told me once it's kind of fun to watch me fumble because it makes them feel okay about doing it themselves. I'm like, great, I will fumble for you. Um, so we always like to start with where we're from. And um, what I'm gonna talk about today is about libraries and virtual field trips. And Nebraska, we are, I'm coming to you from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, as I said. With kids, I would say, who's been, and I'll say it to you guys, who's been to Morrill Hall in the last two years? Raise your hand. Anybody been to Morrill Hall in the last two years? All right, that's what. How about anybody been to a corner square football game in the last two years? Give me a big old touchdown. Anybody been to a corner square football game? Oh, there we go. I see a few. Well, as you can see, we are on the University of Nebraska Lincoln campus, and the corner square football team has the distinct pleasure of being one block away from us. And we are um, we are the the state's museum. We are a research museum, so I work with a lot of scientists. And in our museum, we have. Uh, creatures from the past, our rocks and minerals from the uh, make this great place we live in, and we have a look at animals from the future. So for about 30 years, we have been doing our, we have a really great gallery program um, and our informal learning education kind of aspect. But about five or six years ago, we were really aware that there were very few, we were getting fewer and fewer school buses coming to us. And so we were take, take, trying to take a look at what was happening to field trips. And I worked with a very innovative director at the time. And she said, uh, she had this idea about doing virtual learning programs. And we kind of had a perfect storm because we had, uh, we had this director with a great idea. We had a donor who was willing to give us some money. We had me and I have a background in uh, film and video, which you don't have to have to do virtual learning, but it kind of helped us. And so we started creating our virtual learning program about six years ago. And some of you probably know what a virtual learning program is, but for those of you who don't, I'm gonna show you a really quick um, video here. Again, you have to share correctly or it doesn't work. And here we go. This is, tells you a little bit about what a virtual field trip is. The reality is today, kids are not taking field trips as often. Our state is over 400 miles across. It can take a lot of time, money, and resources to get here. So what we're doing is knocking down our walls to share what we have here at the State's Museum. Our virtual field trips can bring students from all across the state of Nebraska here to Lincoln to their Natural History Museum. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. We are live in the gallery, and it is not a green screen. We are actually in the galleries, so they actually are walking through the halls just as they would if they were actually here. A lot of these kids do not have the opportunity to travel north to go to the UNL State Museum. So if we can bring that into the classroom, it's given them an opportunity they would not normally have. Thank you. Okay, so that was this discussion talking about how we did it with uh, classes. But it's the same thing. Um, no matter who we are talking with, classes, libraries, um, older people. Today, we had a program with international folks. Because um, of what a virtual field trip is, it's a two-way interactive extent. And it's kind of, for you all, we think of it as a digital extension of your media center. Um, there are 
over 150 that I know of natural scientific and cultural institutions in which have virtual learning programs, offer virtual field trips, whatever you might want to call them. And there's a lot of possibilities for you to have a thematic opportunity, such as how do I plan for a summer reading program. So a couple of years ago, I met Sally at a uh, conference of some sort. I don't even remember which one, Sally, as we're trying to get the word out there that we do these virtual field trips. And she kind of was like, do you do anything for summer reading programs? And we were like, oh, we've never done that. We think about classrooms. So we actually created a program called um, Rocks Are Universal because I think no, it was um, Studies Rock because you had Reading Rocks, I believe was the library theme. So we made a thing about rocks. Um, I know it wasn't what you're talking about. We weren't music and all this stuff, but we we're kind of expanding, expanding the theme. And I just wanna say thank you for that because that has become one of our most uh, sought after programs in the years since, because we were able to develop even further to actually meet some standards for fifth grade uh, Nebraska kids. So, um, We've been doing libraries for a little bit, and there's a couple of things that we've learned in the last couple of years of, of, of providing programming for libraries. So I want to get into that, but I really want you to start thinking about um, what is it that you as a library need from your virtual learning program? And what is it that I have learned that um, how a program can think about how to give that to you? So um, the first thing is, what do you need? It, I, Virtual field trips allow you to connect with the world. There are folks like us literally all around the world who offer programming. Later on, I'll tell you about a site where you can go and you can look at people in uh, Israel and Australia and Canada. There's a lot of Canadians and us all over around the country who are doing it. So no matter where your library is, you can connect your patrons to the world. Yes, I know you do that every day with your books. Um, so this is an extension of how do you do that. So if I were reading, so what do you need? If you were thinking, oh, next summer, virtual field trips, sounds great. What do I really need to do that, Annie? You really need some really basics. You've got to have an internet connection or a broadband, and you really need your laptop computer with a webcam microphone and your Zoom app. I know you have a Zoom app because you're on today. Really, and then connect it probably to some sort of way to display it so that if you have more than five people there, they don't have to get around your laptop or your computer to look at it. But then the question is like, okay, that sounds great, but the question is what do I really need? So to have a successful virtual, to, to bring a successful virtual program into your library, you really do need to have some solid broadband. And um, that's one thing we have discovered in connecting with some libraries in the last couple of years is, we can, our, our programming and how we're doing it can really kind of kill your broadband. We've been known to figure out technically how to connect. But I asked that question uh, today. I have a friend named Tom Rolfs who works for the um, state and his job is to increase broadband across the state. And so I said to him, I said, Tom, really, what does a library need so that they know that they could do virtual broadbands? And he said, well, what you really need to do a solid bringing downloading and being able to have it go out would be 12 MBS. That can do a lot in your library. If you had three to six, that'd be the minimum you would need um, in your library to bring in a virtual field trip. That is, as long as there, as he told me, quote, there are no other devices are on in your library's network, which means I haven't walked in with my phone, I'm not checking my, my Facebook or anything like that. So the next question might be from you. Well, if you don't know, I mean, if somebody asked me how much we had broadband we had, I would not know. He gave me a place to go. And um, the Nebraska Gov has a place that you can go. I'm going to take you to it right now where you can check. Sorry about all those. My son would be like, mom, how many do you have to have open? But um, this is a site where you can go to check where how much broadband you have. I'm actually going to put the link in our chat line as soon as I stop sharing so that you can get there as well. So it has all 93 Nebraska counties. Um, Tammy, tell me someplace, which county should I check? Let's just check a county. Burt County. We'll try Burt County and we'll see. So this tells us um, Burt County broadband facts. So you can see kind of the broadband available 
in the county, but more than that, it tells you your library and how much your library has. So Lyons Public Library, remember I said, if you had, uh, you need at least 12 and so forth, 100 is awesome. So um, actually every one of these libraries could do a virtual field trip program. I'm gonna tell you the lead to CAMA, we would have to know that because um, with only six to six to 12, we would definitely make a connection, but there might be a way that we might have to be aware of lapses and it might just go a little slower here and there. But my point is you can see what you have and you can see um, what you might need. So let me get back here. I'm gonna stop share real quick. And in the chat line, I'm going to give you here is, there you go. That's what, that's the site that I just went to. Um, I put it in the chat line. All right, so you know how much broadband you need. And now you know where you can go to check it to see if you have enough broadband. The next question can be is like, what happens if you find out I do not have enough broadband? Um, the other thing I was told is, go to your regional directors and staff at the Nebraska Library Commission. Am I right, Sally? Um, she's, she's shaking her head yes, and Tammy's saying yes. And the other th reason I wanna tell you yes is because there is money out there for us to help your library become a virtual learning center. You could become the virtual learning center for your community, for your county, whatever, because there are some E-Trade, all that other good stuff. I don't know all the words. Um, Tom sent me about a two-page email explaining it all, um, but I'm sure if you go to your regional directors and staff at the commission, they can also help you say, we need more, how can we get it? And there are um, a lot of people out there that wanna see libraries have stronger broadband. If you do it for no other reason, because you think you have, we think we have great programs and you wanna see our programs, I would feel honored. So first of all, you gotta work on your broadband. So then the next thing you say is, okay, Annie, I really need, I got broadband, I know I can do it. What do I look for in a good virtual program? And these are three things that I would suggest that you look for in a really good virtual learning program. One is when you are looking at the program and what they say you do, are they really interactive? Um, and interactive means more than asking questions and going back and forth. Do they have your audience standing up and doing things? Do they ask you to make something while you're doing it? Um, do they show a lot of videos that you may not see in other ways? Kind of whatever you think you might need. We, at you, we have a theory um, when we create our programs, not a theory, we have kind of a creation um, process that we try to have something interactive every five minutes. And it really depends on the age of the kids. So like when we're looking at younger kids, we definitely every five minutes, middle and older kids and adults, we might go a little longer. Um, but we do everything from little kids, having them do listening things, activities. We have them do things with their bodies, stand up, sit down. Um, with middle-aged kids and uh, even adults, we've had them actually get their phones out and get to another app. And we can do little games with them that way, as well as a lot of time for questions and answers. So that would be one thing to think about is how interactive do you, can you be and can it, uh, do you want it to be? One of the lessons we learned a couple of years ago um, with our first library program we did is we did with the rocks. Um, we had you needed to have Play-Doh and cause you're gonna learn how to make rocks and then pull them up. Play-Doh was a way to pull them apart, put them together and learn how rocks formed that way. We quickly learned that that worked for a smaller audience. It did not work for your audiences where you had a vast range of ages come in, like one place had brought in their camp of kids, and then they also had five parents with their preschool kids. And then, you know what I'm talking about. The audience was, and we were like, okay, I'm a mom. I've taken my kids to plenty of things. I knew this, but we had not thought it through. And so we kind of learned our lesson um, and also really working with the librarians beforehand of what's your comfort zone. Um, maybe you just have a couple of libraries, we just had the librarian show it. They just had the, li the, the Play-Doh in front of the kids. They had them do it afterwards and so forth. So um, ask those questions. The other one is where the place that you're going for, where are they Zooming from? Um, I would not normally be doing green screen. I'm really not in the museum. 
Um, actually, like I told you, my whole family is home. So they're all walking behind me right now. Um, and you can't see them, but I'm in the museum. Um, but where do they zoom from? Now, the point is, I obviously could do zoom from here. I could do a program from here if I had all of my fossils and everything I want to show the kids. We do our zooms from our galleries. And it's very important to us that we are from our galleries. We have a lot of stuff. We want to show you our stuff. We want the, you to get your hands on our stuff. But there are some really good providers that I know of that, like us, have not been able to be in their galleries um, for some time for different reasons. And they have made these terrific programs using Zoom. And yet they still have the kids doing things. Again, though, it's just a really good question of where, you do, where are they coming from? Where do they Zoom from? Do they come from uh, their institution? Um, are they using green screen? You can kind of ask some of those questions. And then the next one, of course, is how does it fit my theme? You guys have a theme. It's a great theme. And there's a lot that can fit your need theme. All right. So I've been talking a lot. So how do we fit your theme? So those are some, some, some things that I just hope that um, what I really just was hoping that is I think a library program utilizing virtual field programs, virtual learning programs for the next summer is a great idea. We at the museum have made the decision that we will be doing all of our live programs will become virtual programs from now until at least April. We tried to go back to some of the live programs, but it's not, it's not happening. And just an FYI, I'm just letting you know that what we as an institution have had to figure out. Um, we're, you know, if we have anyone who comes in for a field trip this spring, we, that would be great. We're really not depending on it. And we're hoping that our obviously uh, folks come to visit us more in the summer. Obviously, we know how things go. Um, but we're also quite aware that virtual is really kind of where the world is for us at this point. We're expanding our programs for that reason. And I actually think for a library program, if I were planning your summer program, I would probably plan at least half of it to be virtual. Here's the other beautiful thing. You can cancel us up to two weeks beforehand. If you find someone who can come in live and do it better, and your virtual folks will, you know, we don't have to, it's not like we're out of gas or you had to feed us or house us. If you give us enough time, we're like, okay, it would have been fun to come play with you, but we get it. Um, in the meantime, it's, it's, it helps you to be able to plan to know that you can do something. So I took that next step and I thought, okay, if I was planning your program for the next summer for animals, tales and tales, what would I plan? What would my curriculum be? So here's my idea. Please play with me. Um, so first of all, um, I would use us because we have some great programs. Um, and I'm gonna go to our site as well. And this is us. Um, we, this is, let me go back to here, went to the wrong place. Oh, don't tell me that, I know I'm here. Hold on here, my friends, I know I'm, I'm here. I just have to move some things around. There we go. Um, so this is our website. Again, I will put it in the chat line. Um, we started six years ago, or we started with one program um, in March when the shutdown can't happen, we had seven programs. We now have 17. Remember I told you we're not wasting a good, a good crisis. So we made a bunch of different programs um, to meet a lot of different needs. Um, change our website a little bit. You can kind of see what we hit. Like I said, we are a science program, but look, we even have a, a site for you guys to go to and click on it. Um, I would say for a library programs this summer, and if you just look at our, our set we have here, um, there are three programs that jump out at me about animals. That would be great. One of them is called Animals in the Hall. That's meant for pre-K through about second grade. We kind of are down in our wildlife hall. We look at our dioramas. We talk about animals and survival techniques. We have them listen, we have them move. And then you kind of make a diorama. It's gonna be, it's a great program. Um, something that you can Annie, easily follow up. Yes. I don't think we're seeing what you think we're seeing because we see UNSM and the oh. URL and then the world, but we're not seeing a list or anything. Is that what you thought was up there? Let's see this. Do you see this now? Okay, this there we go. Now? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Sally. Oh, she did the golden rule of virtual. If you're not seeing what the person's talking about, don't be Nebraska nice 
interrupt them and tell them, I can't hear you. You're making no sense, lady. I don't see your picture because there's nothing worse to us than to realize we've yammered on and nobody knows what we're talking about. Here's our sub website. Um, what I was talking about is that we actually have a whole, whole section for just libraries for you to come and look to say what kind of programs do they have. And this is what I was talking about. Three programs that we have that would fit for you next summer is Animals in the Hall, Stories, Skulls Tell, and Who Lives Here. They're all about animals in different ways. I'm not gonna go into depth, but every single one of them, we have our viewers are listening, are doing, they're filling their faces. Um, and they're also, we're also looking almost always at animals from Nebraska. So that is uh, one site you can come to. The other thing I want to say is, let's see here, I wanna go back. Are you back to my PowerPoint? Nope, okay, I gotta stop sharing, come back. Um, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. We have a brand new exhibit opening in January and people, this is what it's called, poop and pause. I mean, when Tammy said, do you think you can come up with something for next summer? I'm like, oh, I think we have it. Um, here it is, the thing is, this is as fancy as I can be about it because the exhibit is not even up yet, but it's about exactly that, poop and pause. It's about looking at tracks and scat to see who lived here and you can interpret your environment. And so we were like super excited to hear about your uh, theme because we, we, we can definitely use this gallery and this exhibit to create you a really good program. I wish I could tell you more, um, but you're, just have to say, yes, we want you. And um, I don't, you can't even register for it yet because it's not even on our website. But if you are interested, please send me an email. I'll send my email at the end and we will put you on the list and we'll get you so that you'll know what our program is. Um, but we do know we'll have some interactive, um, not that kind of interactive. I'm not quite sure how interactive, but there will be some interactivity to it. But so yes, that's coming this, that will be available to you next year. I think it'll be an excellent virtual learning opportunity. The other two sites I just want to say real quick is uh, CILC.org and Envis. And I'm going to go to both of those real quick. And I have to do it this way. So CILC, I just had them both open. Um, okay, we'll go to CILC here. CILC is a um, place for, um, it has over 150 providers who are part of this um, kind of a conglomerate, if you will, and has all kinds of programs. You wanna search for a program up here, let's just say we're gonna do animals and it will come up with all the different sites that you can go to that can tell you something about animals. Um, and so as you can see, there's a lot of live places. The zoos are amazing. There are zoos across the country and in Canada who want to talk to you and they'll bring out their animals to show them to you. Um, there are people who are, who are some puppeteers who are doing some amazing things about uh, having you make a puppet and then doing storytelling at the end of it. Um, so this is a great site as you can see that you could just go to and go, wow, what could we do with animals, what animals could I bring in? And oh, look, there we are. We are listed as one of their providers. Um, so that's just one of the sites, CILC.org. Again, I promise I will put these in the chat line. The other site is this one. Um, it's this called Envis, and this is done by our ESU folks. Um, they have made a list of all of the folks in Nebraska who are offering virtual field trips. And so you could go through here and also find them, many of which are free because many of them are our state and national parks. Um, but like here's Animal Poetry by Nebraska Game and Parks. I have no idea what that's about, but you can see how it could probably fit. Again, there we are. That's not why I showed you, but um, there's a lot of folks who are doing virtual programming. Um, the other thing I've been doing this uh, fall has been training, a lot of training, because a lot of folks have been asking us, how do we do what you guys are doing? So that is 
it in a nutshell. I would go to those sites. I would start looking around. I would probably go to a live animal place. I would probably do something that they helped create something. I would go to a science center. Um, my point being is your curriculum is whatever you could want to make it be. Um, first of all, do your homework. Find out if you have enough broadband to make that happen. If you don't, please work with the Library Association in the state of Nebraska to make it better. Become your community's virtual learning center and then bring in the world to your community. <sighs> Questions while I type in um, all those uh, sites? Oh, don't tell me I did a thorough job. You must have questions. I have a question, Annie. Yes. Um, I know in the past you have done programs where you send a box of items for the kids to handle, but that's when the kids are in the room and plus there's, you know, touching and feeling and it's all of that off the table for right now because I would assume probably yes. Um, we have actually figured out ways to do our kits. So we are still sending out kits if kits if it is requested. Um, what we do is when it comes back, depending on the kit, we are either letting it sit for 72 hours before we send it back out, or if, it, if we're able to, we are using a cleaning product on it. But you know, we have one kit that has actual fossils in it and we are not wiping down those fossils with cleaning products. So when the kit comes in, we put it aside and we make sure it doesn't go back out until 72, at least 72 hours and the stuff that can be wiped down in it is wiped down. So yes, we are still sending out our kits and we do have learning kits available. Like Sally's talking about, it's beyond our virtual field trip programs. We have these things called learning kits and we actually have an animal one, yes. Um, Animal Detective. We have a learning kit called Animal Detective. And um, that would be a great thing. I know libraries in the past, what they've done is that they've connected with us for the virtual field trip. And then they also took out one of our kits. So our kit was laying in the table. So when we were done with the program, the kids could go and look at all the rocks. I think that's what several folks did. And then they could interact with the rocks that also came from the museum. So they're looking at actual specimens is the really good thing. So yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm getting to another question. Any other questions? Oh, you better have questions or else I'll be like, it'll go to my head. Oh, Tammy, you must have a question, please. <laughs> I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, are these virtual programs, does it work like we can send out a Zoom link so kids can stay at home or do they need to be here in like a classroom setting and then you come to us as a group? Good question. Um, that is really kind of up to you. Um, we have done both. So this past summer, um, sorry, I was just getting the end biz thing there. Uh, this past summer, we did mm, maybe half a dozen library programs and about half of them did them as webinars. So, cause their library was closed. So they created the Zoom webinar and the nice thing about a webinar is that's the safest way to Zoom. It's hard to bomb, Zoom bomb a webinar because you have to register and you have to get the, the number. And that can totally be done. So no matter where your patrons are, they can be at home, they can register through you and then um, you you set up the pro you set up the Zoom program, and then we just present. Um, we're really good at presenting <laughs> to not being able to hear anybody um, because we did a bunch of webinars in the spring. We learned how to do that very well. Um, so you can also do a Zoom meeting just like this. It's kind of up to you. Uh, we don't care how many people we're talking to. Um, we work where we can see up to. I mean, quite frankly, um, we can do it where, where everybody just sees me, we can control it that way. So you could have 20, 30 people watching and they're still gonna see the big screen of me. Um, and that it makes an interaction a little bit trickier, but um, if we know that's happening, what we usually do is we have a second 
uh, educator who's moderating and then they can moderate the chat line and the questions and it flows really well. And quite a few providers are starting to do that as well just because there's a lot going on here. So sometimes it's nice to have a second person. So we can do it um, however you want to do it. Webinar, uh, people having to come to your spot, you send out the links to people, however it works best for your library. Is what is the title of the animal learning kit? I believe it's called Animal Detectives. Oh, what's the cost? Ha! Huh. There you go. I, I, I'm bad. I create them. I don't. <laughs> I don't talk about costs for libraries. I believe it's eighty-five dollars. Um, it might be eighty-five and a hundred, like eighty, eighty-five for. Well, let's go to the website and check. It will tell us. Um, and then we then we'll know for sure. Let's see here. Um, libraries for 30 minutes it's 80, and for 45 minutes it's a hundred dollars. Yeah. It's terrible. I always forget that part. Thank you for asking me that question. And I don't mean to do it on purpose. I just forget. Um, is the Animal Learning Kit something we can replicate so kids can have a kit that they can use from home? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know off the top of my head what is in our kits, but I do know, again, if you go to our website, you can look up our kits and there's a list of what's in each and every one of our kits so that you could look at it to see if, I believe we include like animal coverings and and scents and stuff like that. So it might be a bit tricky, but with some creative thinking, maybe you could figure out how to replicate it. Um, uh, and also, you know, if you wanted several kits, I mean, a phone call to us, a phone call to any one of these providers that anybody I've talked to is, is everybody's waiting to talk with you. Um, so don't be afraid to call and ask that question. So, and I've gone over my time. Well, this was awesome, Annie. Thank you so much. Well, you are welcome. And I can't say it loud enough that if you are just, the first thing I would suggest you do is check your broadband and um, check to see, and I believe I put that in the chat line, check to see where you stand. And if you can strengthen your broadband at all, please do so because it'll make the experience so much nicer for you and your patrons, as well as it'll just strengthen everything you can do there in your library. Because from now on, I don't see this going backwards in how much we're going to be using technology. I just see us going forward and um, it increasing and being creative on the use of it. Well, thank you very much, Tammy. Um, I hope I added something to your day. Oh, and um, here's me. If you need me, I'll put my, um, that is me. And if you want to make a reservation, you go to, oops, there you go. So if you need me, that's my email. And if you want to make a reservation, so you go to Elephant. But the easiest way is just to go to our website and then do it that way. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And Jackie, I have already made you and your three helpers all host, co-host, if you're ready to go. Wonderful. I'll get our screen shared and we'll begin in just a moment. Okay. And there's a break set up for after your, after your session. So if you go over, it's no problem at all. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. All right, is everyone seeing the main screen? Awesome, I see a thumbs up. I have multiple screens here, so I have to figure out which way to look. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting the 4-H STEM Reading Connections team to be a part of your workshop this afternoon. So we're really excited to give you um, really just a sneak peek of some of the programming details that we're working on for 2021. 
So here is a picture. Oops. Yep. Here's a picture of all of our dedicated team members. So you can see that there's 10 of us and we are actually spread out across the state. What's really cool about our group is we all have various kind of content specialties, which bring a lot of diversity to our program planning and to the development of the STEM Reading Connections program. So as you look at all the pictures of our team members, feel free in the chat box to give a shout out to someone maybe that you've worked with in the past or that you're familiar with. So if you wanna type their name in the chat, you can sure do that. But other than that, I'm gonna pass it on to Jennifer and she's gonna tell you a few more details just about the history of our program. And then we'll dig right into what our 2021 plans look like. Excellent, thanks Jackie. So in order to get started, if you can, we're gonna ask you to play along with us. Um, we're gonna do kind of a quick way to kind of gauge what, um, what level of participation you've had with Nebraska Extension. So if everyone wants to shut off their cameras, and then if you can answer yes to any of these following questions, please turn your camera on. And we understand not everyone has cameras and so don't stress out if you don't have a camera. So question number one, if you have partnered at all with Nebraska Extension in the past, summer reading, after school, um, Saturday programs, in any way, shape, or form, please turn on your camera if you have partnered with Nebraska Extension. Excellent. We're seeing a lot of cameras come back on. That makes me excited. Okay. Next question. Have you ever utilized any of our 4-H STEM Reading Connections resources? If the answer is yes, Leave your cameras on. If it's no, flip them off for me, please. Excellent. I have to scroll because I can see the slides and I wanted to see faces. Okay, final question. If you utilized our 2020 Imagine Your Story resources, which included the pre-recorded sessions, leave your camera on. If not, flip it off. <clears throat> Okay, a couple, perfect. Now you guys can do what you will with your cameras. It is your now, now your choice. So basically what we are gonna go through with you today very quickly is to help you to gain an understanding of the components of our 2021 4-H STEM Reading Connections program. Um, help us develop a plan to or develop a plan to incorporate the 4-H STEM Reading Connections resources into your library's programming. Next slide, Jackie, I think, perfect. The, 4-H STEM Reading Connection program engages youth in extended 4-H learning opportunities through collaborative summer reading program, which you guys are well aware of. The goals of our program are to provide 4-H youth development opportunities to these youth, offer educational resources to librarians, youth development professionals, early childhood professionals, and parents, spark an interest in the 4-H program, and provide early childhood professionals and parents with storybook guides to support literacy development, enhance their relationships to make the, and to make a connection with their local libraries or with all of you. Okay, so kind of a program overview. We match our 4-H curriculum with the Collaborative Summer Library Program theme. We create a series of four customizable lessons, customizable being key here. You can customize them to make them work in your situation. Um, they're available to libraries, after school programs, 4-H camps, schools, youth development professionals, early childhood professionals, and parents. Um, there's always evaluations for the youth and then the presenter or the teacher. This year, our STEM Reading Connection lessons follow the tale of tales. And so the four areas that we're working on are animal adaptations, heads and tails, your money story, service animals, and farm tales. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. Oh, oops, I got one more slide, I guess. Um, basically, our lesson plan format is the same for all four lessons, so it does make it a little bit easier for you. We have the learning objectives, the material list, preparation. There's always a physical fitness component, component because we know a lot of times those youth are very wiggly. Um, so this year, we included a social emotional component. There's an introduction, opening questions, activities one, two, and three. There's an early childhood component. We're gonna have book suggestions and each of the lessons this year are going to have a fable attached to them. Um, there's vocabulary and resources. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Cam. Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am actually new to the STEM 
um, reading program team. My name is Cameron Alfords. I'm with 4-H in Buffalo County, which shout out, I saw Gibbon was on the Zoom call earlier. And what I'm going to be doing today is just walking you guys through what a typical lesson will look like. I just chose one activity from our animal adaptations lesson, and we're going to kind of dig into it and see how it works. So I'll have Jackie click really quick for me. I want to get you guys a little bit involved. So maybe take your library hat, put it off to the side and put on your, um, you know, your child hat, your elementary hat, and kind of be thinking in the shoes of a child today. So my question here, what makes a camouflage pattern effective? Any ideas? If you have any thoughts on that, go ahead and type it in the chat. We can see here that we have an image on the screen. There is an animal who is utilizing camouflage. So if we think about maybe specifically that camouflage pattern, what makes it effective? Any thoughts? Go ahead and type those in the chat. We thought we would kind of structure this presentation in a virtual learning environment where you guys can kind of see what this would look like if we do take it the next level into virtual learning, which we'll talk about later as well. Tammy typed in the chat, she said color. Crystal said color, texture. I see people are talking about patterns, colors. Yes, exactly. Go ahead and click next for me, Jackie. When we think about camouflage patterns, we all kind of have this understanding of what camouflage means and maybe the youth in your programs will as well, but it's important to start that discussion. And so it says here after, happening, after asking the opening questions, we're going to ask students to select from animal coloration cards. We have cards that are provided with the lesson that will represent camouflage and it'll be an image just like this of that owl utilizing camouflage and they'll get to talk about it in groups. That's where we're kind of getting the experience started by having just group discussion. So there on the next bullet point, it says we will have students carefully examine their chosen animal's coloration and its habitat and write down what they notice about the animal's coloration that helps it to blend in with its, with its environment, which is what we just did right now. We talked about what is going on with this owl, what makes him blend into his environment. And then we can dig a little bit deeper as well and talk about the habitat habitat and where the animal is living. You know, we can see this picture of this owl and we might assume he's in a forest or he's in a tree, but until we get those youth talking and discussing, um, they're not going to really understand that until we really start to dig into it. And so then you guys actually brought me to the third bullet point, which is prompt students to think about the formal elements of camouflage, which you guys actually listed a couple in the chat. Shape, pattern, color, those elements of art. Absolutely. So we'll go ahead and click onto the next screen, Jackie. All right, so this is where it gets super, super fun. It's been pretty fun, now it's getting super fun. So we're gonna talk about camouflage design. So my question for you guys is what is this human doing? If we use our visual thinking strategies, we look at this image, what is this human doing? It's kind of a funny, funny picture when you look at, kind of again, examine the environment, examine the tools that the human has. And this is where we start talking with the youth about not only do animals use camouflage, but humans do as well. All right, I have some friends typing in the chat, blending in, yes, photography, taking photos of animals in nature, really good guesses, really good thoughts when you look at this picture. And so we would talk to the youth and just say, you know, for wildlife photographers to get the best photos, like National Geographic, they are going to have to be camouflaged. And so that's why they're simulating this camouflage on everything, the hat, the face mask, the outfit, even the camera has camouflage. And so as you can see below, it says, let students know that now they're going to use this analysis of effective camouflage in nature to design their very own camouflage fabric. So this is where we take STEM and we're actually adding in another letter, you guys. We're adding in the A to turn it into STEAM for a little bit. We're going to get really artistic with this specific activity. So you guys can see here, I've actually piloted this lesson with some elementary youth at a workshop before. So I wanted to include some photos so you guys could kind of see how it would work. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a swatch, which is a small example of a fabric pattern. We're gonna utilize origami paper, or in your case, whatever you might have at your library, maybe you just have construction paper, you can chop it up into small four by four sheets. And the challenge here, 
is that the youth are going to pick one background color and then three additional colors, which is going to help them to cut out shapes to sort of blend into their chosen habitat background. So our next bullet here says students are going to choose from the habitat background cards, which are also going to be included in these resources. They'll choose a habitat that they think is really interesting and they are going to create a swatch, a camouflage swatch that's going to simulate fabric that would be worn in this environment. So what I might say to this youth in this picture, uh, for example, let's call him Luke. I would say, Luke, if you were in the coral reef, what do you think you would need to wear to blend in so the, the fish or the animals wouldn't see you? So that's kind of how we get them thinking about putting themselves in the shoes of someone wearing this camouflage. Go ahead to the next screen for me, Jackie. So you guys can see here, the next and final step is a design review. So there might be some youth who have chosen the same habitat background. You can see right here, the example I just used, it was the um, coral reef was the habitat card. And that's that very large piece of paper there in the middle. And the other pieces of paper that are around there, those are all swatches that youth made. And so you can see kind of how they take different approaches. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of them just use their background swatch and they put shapes on top. But there was that one youth who really chose to go outside of the box. And on that very bottom right side, you can see that that youth cut up all of his origami and kind of put it together to simulate the shape of those pieces of coral and those, those pieces of, you know, sea urchins or whatever would be down there. And so that is basically it. That's just a very brief explanation of what one activity would look like. And that's, again, from the animal adaptations lesson. And so there's actually two other awesome activities that go along with it with this one. So go ahead to the next screen for me, Jackie. Now that we've talked about what our program is, what it's going to look like a little bit this year, we're going to take a break for a little bit more engagement and we want to hear from you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Jackie stop sharing the screen and I will share my screen really quick. And if you guys have questions, don't worry, we will give you time for questions. This is where we'll give you guys some time to start thinking about how we can use this curriculum. So what I want you guys to do is to join me at slido.com. Now, what you can do is you can use your smartphone to type it in, or you can scan our QR code here, and it's going to take you to a... Um, to a, a uh, oh geez, I can't make words today, to a poll. We're gonna just pull you guys and kind of talk about some different things. So once you are in, you should be seeing one poll. And that's gonna say, what modes of virtual or remote learning have you worked with? We really wanna gauge where you guys have been. Obviously we've been in this pandemic situation for a long time. So we kind of want to know what modes have you accessed? So you might type in there that you've done take and makes. There's a couple um, libraries in my county that have done projects where they put the materials together in a bag and they let the families take those bags home. Um, have you done maybe Zoom learning? Have you done pre-recorded videos? So once you are, once you have accessed this through Slido, That'll give you the chance to actually type in there. And we should see all of your answers pop up. Are you guys having trouble accessing it or is it working? Jackie says it's working. Okay. Jackie, maybe put in um, a sample answer and see if it pops up. It should be popping up into like a word cloud for us all to see. Might have to give it a minute too. Oh. Oh my gosh, I had to push one button to show the results. Okay, so here we can see um, it's putting together a word cloud for us. So the words that are the biggest, those are the ones that are um, being answered the most frequently. So a lot of people are saying Zoom, take and makes. Um, thank you to the folks who are putting in a lot of different options. Um, Facebook story time, how fun. Facebook live trivia games, awesome live presenters, book clubs, really good options. This gives us at 4-H a really good, um, good look at what you guys already have done and how we can help you moving forward with your program if you do choose to utilize our curriculum. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next poll here. Just got two more. And I will start with number two. 
This is also important. We want to know what are potential barriers that you foresee with virtual learning. And again, it should just be the same Slido code for you guys to enter in here. Um, I see some folks are already typing in um, burnout, definitely here at 4-H, depending on what county we're in. A lot of us have been doing the virtual thing for quite a while. I had to get some blue light glasses at one point because I was like, what is happening to my brain? Um, some folks are saying time consuming, Wi-Fi, too much virtual learning, holding kids attention. Sure. And these are all absolutely um, understandable things that come into play when we think about virtual learning. Internet accessibility, that's a big one. Holding kids attention, miscommunication, disconnected from the library. I know it. I know it. People are burned out with screens. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. So again, these are just helping us at 4-H to understand kind of your guys' experience. And one last question for you all here. Thank you for taking the time to fill these out for us. On a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with virtual learning? We are just curious, how do you feel? Do you feel like, you know what, I can turn on Zoom in two minutes and already have a presentation ready to go. Sometimes I feel that way. Um, or are you still thinking, you know, maybe I need more practice. Um, someone the other day called me a virtual learning expert and I laughed. I started laughing. I was like, yeah, I've been doing it. That does not mean I'm an expert, you know? All right. So it looks like we have quite a few folks that have answered so far about 15. Mm. Looks like a lot are fairly comfortable, not incredibly comfortable give you guys a couple more seconds to fill that out. The reason why we wanted to do this today is to really see what, what is most beneficial on your end. Um, as, as Jackie had mentioned, we did pre-recorded videos, or maybe it was Jennifer mentioned, we did pre-recorded videos last year in 2020, and we weren't sure if that was the right route to go this year. So thank you all very much for, for playing along with that and for engaging me a little bit. I am going to go ahead and throw it back to Jackie. Jackie, you're muted. You know, multiple screens, they're beautiful, but sometimes when you want your mouse on a specific screen, you think, where did it go? Um, so thank you, Jennifer and Cam, for sharing a little bit about what our plans are for the 2021 4-H age, kind of that um, kindergarten to sixth grade age um, range that we're used to coming into the libraries and doing programs for. So Cam gave a beautiful example of the animal adaptations and maybe you're excited to see how one of the other lessons is all going to be um, on money. So kind of a different twist to tails when we're thinking heads and tails of money. So we are still in the design process and that's why Cam was reaching out and asking you to fill out some of these Slido polls just so we focus our efforts um, where they'll be more, most beneficial to you. So you just got a little snapshot of the older youth in regards to what that part of the 4-H STEM Reading Connections program will look like. Now Sarah and I are going to take just a few minutes and talk about the early childhood STEM storybook guides. So last year we piloted uh, this program that specifically targeted childcare providers and parents because we realized that there were a group of children who were maybe not able to make it to, li to the library for traditional programming during the actual the library day or during, during the day, I want to say school day, but it's not during school. And so what we did is we created these storybook guides that um, any caring adult, even a grandparent or a babysitter or the parents or child care providers, like I mentioned, can pick up, they're tied to the theme, and they can take those storybooks, have a storybook to read, have engaging questions um, to be able to discuss that book back and forth, and then sticking with that STEM theme, have a, a STEM connections activity that they can do together. And what's really fun about storybooks is um, storybooks are all about play. And so they spark imagination and creativity. So there's ways that these storybook guides um, had lessons at extensions. And so we're going to continue on with that this year, maybe in the chat book box. Last year, they were brochures. So if you want to type in the chat box, whether you were able to utilize the brochures, they're all based on fairy tales. Um, that would be really helpful. I know that some people were putting them in their packets that they were sending home. 
others were maybe sharing on their website. So there are multiple different ways that we've learned just from our evaluation data on how they were being used. All right, so thank you to Randolph. I see that they were able to utilize them. And if you haven't, that's okay. So maybe we can share a little bit more today and it might be something that you want to include in your programming this coming summer. So I'm gonna let Sarah tell us a little bit more of why, why animals? All right, well, my name is Sarah Roberts and I am with Nebraska Extension as well with the Learning Child Team. Um, and if anyone on here knows me at all, they would know that I love animals and I love nature. So it was, um, I'm very excited about this year's theme. And Jackie and I are looking forward to um, creating a lot of really fun things for not just early childhood, because really these can be used for any age level. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to kind of just touch on quickly is the reason why we want to use animals with children and some of the benefits of that. Um, so animals are really important to children. And so if you um, have ever seen children interacting with animals, they're, they're drawn to them. And so it's just a very easy thing to convince children to get on board with. And it doesn't take a whole lot of selling, I guess. And so um, this is just a really easy way to, to get children engaged and to do some really fun things with them. Um, then there's something called biophilia hypothesis, and that is put out by E.O. Wilson. He's a naturalist, and he kind of came up with this term that just means that we as humans are drawn to other living things, and that includes plants and animals, so it's all living things because we can find commonalities with those things. Um, and then, like I kind of said already, children just have a natural curiosity about living things, um, and then we kind of want to look at the connection to nature. And so there's been, especially this year with so much screen time and so much uh, time indoors with, with all the things going on, there's just a really, really huge need to get back to nature and be able to, to utilize the outdoors. And so this is a perfect way to do that because <clears throat> as children, excuse me, connect with animals, they can build those connections with the environment and also learn about conservation of their environment. And so, you know, we want to raise our next generation to be good stewards of our land. And so this, this goes along with working with animals. And then they can, animals provide a lot of sensory experiences. And so anybody that has a pet or a classroom pet or just has a farm, any of those things, all of these sensory experiences are important, especially as young children are developing. So they see them, they may be able to touch them. Sometimes they can smell them. Um, animals like, make lots of different sounds. And so just all of those sensory experiences are, are involved in animals and, and learning with animals. And then we can look at the social emotional aspects of using animals. And there was a class that I taught um, a while back on this. And I think that we often forget that animals are often used in therapy, um, especially with children with physical and emotional um, deficiencies because animals can help with those skill building. And so you think about how many uh, service animals that you may see out there, but those, those kinds of animals are specifically trained to be able to help us as humans to function better. So we also can teach children that when they care for animals, they learn a lot of different skills. And so there's skills like empathy. Um, they may learn to kind of connect with those animals and build relationship skills. And then the last kind of point here is just that animals react to children's actions. And so they have an effect on their behavior. And so it's kind of like when children are, you know, we all know that they always have a lot of energy. And so if they're really excited and then they run up screaming, sometimes animals react kind of like, whoa, what is this person? Or what is this creature that's coming up to me? So children can play off of those um, reactions and kind of learn how to navigate through those things. And so there's a lot of information and I have a book and I don't know if I can show it on here. It's called Connecting Animals and Children. And if you want, I can type the name in the chat also, but it's a really great resource to have, especially if you have people that are really kind of leery about using animals. And really it's specific to live interactions. Um, the, the lessons that we have don't really include live interactions with animals, but if you have 
um, a class pet or you have an animal that you're able to bring into these lessons, I highly encourage it because there's all kinds of research behind using live animals and just using the, the theme of animals with young children. So if you have any questions, I'll put that book in there and I'll also, our, our, I think our emails are at the end, but I'll put my email in there as well, so. All right, thank you, Sarah. And I know that you um, alluded to these storybook guides and um, how they necessarily won't be hands-on with animals, but let's give them a little sneak peek of what they are going to look like. So we'll have eight storybook guides and we're not going to get rid of the fairy tale storybook guide. So now there'll be 16 that are available to you in your library. And Sarah and I are just gonna bounce back off each other and just give you a little highlight of what is going to be included in each storybook guide. So the first one up that we have is the desert. And that's you, Sarah. All right, so <laughs> we have, we kind of went through and decided a bunch of habitats that we thought would be really cool to be able to feature in this year's um, themes. And so with the desert, we uh, kind of decided to do some activities with snakes and insects because those are a lot of the, the main animals that live out in the desert. So um, the, the books and the activities will kind of focus around those two animals. So stay tuned for that one. I think it's going to be super fun. Um, and I guess I can move on to the farm one too, <laughs> since that one's mine. So. Um, this one, we are going to talk about different farm animals and different, I guess, the farm overall as a habitat. So the STEM activity for this one is building a barn and kind of thinking about um, specific animal pens and what they may look like. And so it's going to kind of involve a little bit of engineering and the engineering design process. All right. And the next storybook guide is on the forest habitat. And the STEM activity that goes along with this one is we're going to be looking at bats and how bats use echolocation. Um, we're also going to be talking a lot about nocturnal animals and animal tracks. And so we always have a book that's the main story that's featured, but then we have some related readings. And whose tracks are these? A clue book, A Familiar Forest Tract is one of the books that is a related reading for the forest. The next habitat that we'll talk about is pets. And one of the stories that we're going to use as our feature story is Not Norman, um, a goldfish story. And you would discover in this story that there's a little boy and he wants any fish or any pet, but he doesn't necessarily want um, Norman. He doesn't want a fish. And throughout the reading of the story, you learn about how his feelings change and how he realizes, you know what? Norman is a really great pet. And if, even if I'm at a pet shop, I don't think that there's any other animal that I would pick. And so the STEM activity with this lesson is designing a pet carrier um, so that they can carry their pet safely from place to place. The next habitat is the ocean. I'm gonna pass it back over to Sarah. All right, and so the ocean is one of my favorite ones because I am from the South and it is close to the ocean. So I kind of grew up in that area. So the book that's going to be featured with this one is Hello Ocean. So if you're familiar with that book at all, it talks a lot about um, sensory experiences that the child has as they're visiting the ocean. And then the STEM connection or the STEM activity with that is going to be an oil spill lab. And I've done that activity with children of all ages. We did it at a summer camp. Um, when I worked at the zoo. So it's it's a really good one and it kind of talks, it kind of connects with that conservation aspect that I talked a little bit about earlier um, and talks about how some of the impacts we as humans have on, um, on habitats that are out in the wild. All right, and the next habitat is the pond habitat and it's actually going to have a frog focus. So the story that we're going to utilize is, I don't wanna be a frog. And then the STEM activity is actually going to have to do with balloons and static electricity. So they're going to learn about static electricity, make their own little paper frogs, and discover how they can make their frogs jump, which is a really fun activity to do. Next up is the rainforest. All right, the rainforest is another one of my favorites. And um, there's lots of really, really cool animals that live in the rainforest. And so the, the book that goes along with this is The Great Kapok Tree. So I'm sure that one is a familiar one as well. And that one talks a lot about the importance of the trees of the rainforest and um, 
we're going to do an experiment on how trees and leaves breathe. And so there's a really easy and fun experiment that can easily be done with, with young children to show them that um, trees and leaves are still living and how they breathe. And so a lot of times children don't, um, don't consider plants to be living because they don't move, they don't make noise really and stuff like that. So this is a really good way to show them that plants are alive. And so there's a lot of other cool activities that go along with the rainforest lesson. And our last habitat is going to be the Arctic habitat. And we're going to use the story, polar bear, polar bear, what do you hear? And I'm actually going to dig into this a little bit deeper. And I just wanna show you how we, we're reformatting matting our storybook guide. So as I showed you on the screen earlier, we had used brochures. Um, and although we think those worked really well, we learned that a lot of people were pulling up our storybook guides on their phones. And so what we've decided to do is to do a PDF so it'll be a front and a back. So they'll look a lot of the similar content, similar information, but a, a different format. And so this is just a glimpse of what the front and part of the back looks like for the Arctic habitat. Um, you can see right there, there's the book with the storybook connections. And then in this particular activity, um, you're going to learn about how Arctic animals stay warm. And you'll be using a bowl of, of very cold water that has ice in it. And children are going to have the opportunity to put their hands in there. And how long can they keep their hands in there? you know, more than likely, it's not going to be very long. And then there's that discussion that, well, then how do seals and how do Arctic animals, how do they withstand the cold temperatures? And so we create, we talk about blubber and create our own blubber bag, which is Crisco that's put in a Ziploc bag and then sealed with duct tape. And they're able to notice how that blubber acts as an insulator. So when they put their hand back in to the, to the cold water, they're going to notice that, you know, I can leave my hand in there a lot longer. So this is just a snapshot of what they're going to look like. And then you can see on the back, we will have a mu music and movement activity for each storybook guide, a sensory. I really like this one. This is where you make your pretend snow using baking soda and um, white hair conditioner. It is very, it makes your hands very soft and it smells really good. In your library, if you're thinking, oh no, that's not something that we want to do, you're thinking about the mess, you can always do sensory play using white pom-poms or even cotton balls to have a similar effect. And the creative arts activity with this one is fork painting and creating your own polar bear. So this just gives you kind of a snapshot of what you can expect for them to look like. So Sarah's going to tell us how we can get them. Okay, so if you recognize these books that we have, these are the ones from last year. So the, the website that's listed there, that is where all of these lessons are going to be housed. So right now, if you go to this website, these books are the ones that you're going to see because our new ones have not been uploaded yet. But the same, uh, all of the lessons will be there no matter what. And so eventually, as we do this every year, this website will stay the same and it will it will archive the older lessons while featuring the the ones that are new for the year. So even if you go to um, this this website next year, you'll still be able to find these fairy tale ones, but then the new ones that we have. So for this year, it'll be the animal habitats ones. Um, those will be the ones that are featured there, but you'll always be able to find the older ones archived on that same page. Awesome. Well, I know that um, breaks are really valuable. And so one thing that we were hoping that we'd be able to do is maybe to break out into some breakout rooms and find out how maybe you plan on um, utilizing the 4-H STEM Reading Connection resources in your 2021 programming. But I feel like I have a plan B of something that we can do to still be respectful of your time and to help us gather some information as well. And so um, th this is our contact information of Cam and Jennifer and Sarah and I feel free to email us um, and ask us any questions. You might be wondering, like, when will these resources be available? We're sticking with the same timeline that we've used in the past. So the beginning of February is when we will share those out with our extension staff and the library staff across the state. Um, so they will be finished, ready to go, um, and then you'll be able to use them for your programming. But like I mentioned, Finding out how you want to implement them and what you really like is important to us because we still are developing. And so if we were together 
I feel like um, we would be using post-it notes and big chart paper and um, kind of brainstorming and doing some different things together. And so we can do that actually on what's called a, a jam board. So what I encourage all of you to do is to go to go.unl.edu backslash srjam, so summer reading jam. And when you get there, it's, your screen is going to look very similar to mine. And you can see where that blue arrow is. If you click on that blue arrow, a sticky note is gonna pop up. And so you can see the, the yellow sticky note that's on there. And so what our team encourages you to do is we want you to think of two stars and a wish. So what are two things that you're really excited about in regards to the 4-H STEM Reading Connections Program? So you're excited, to, excited things that maybe we, you've heard today or we've presented today. And then what's one wish that you have? What's one wish that you hope that we do or you hope that's included in the program when it's 100% ready to go in February? And hey, once you type- Jackie. I'm yes. not sure what you're, it was telling me I needed to request access. Oh no. Well, I'm probably gonna need to go on there and change that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, no, I but I thought that that'd be important. Right now. Um, so as I do that here in just a moment, so once you have access and you can put your sticky note on there, if you click save, um, it will automatically be on there and that's all you have to do. And then you can click right out of it. So I might let my team members, take a few questions from all of you while I go in and I um, grant access to everyone. So what questions do you have for us? We did a great job. They have no questions. Awesome. I think it's close to it's we're, we're over there break time. I know. I know. I know. I'm, and you That's know, I, I'm doing lots of different clicks to try so to get into the breakout. I'm, I'm going to answer Amber's question. It depends is the answer for this. So some extension staff, you'll have to contact local offices to see if they have staff that are willing to come out. Now, COVID makes everything unknown, right? Um, but really it depends on the local offices, staff availability and their, and their programming area of expertise. So um, we're not promising that extension staff can come and deliver these, but it's worth an ask because worst case scenario, they tell you we can't come and do it. You still have the resources and would be able to implement them on your own, Amber. All right, I think you're going to have to use, I'm not able to shorten the link again really quickly, but try this link in the chat box to find out if you can get to our post-it note. Yes. Ooh, We're I just got a thumbs up and I apologize for that. So Cam, see you're the expert in virtual learning. I still have a long ways to go. Definitely not an expert. Just go with the flow and have fun with it. That's what makes people think you're an expert maybe. Awesome. Well, like I mentioned earlier, thank you to all of you for your time. We're really excited about this year's program and we're keeping our fingers crossed um, that hopefully we can get into the libraries and do some programming again with all of you. So please reach out if you have any questions, leave us your feedback on the sticky notes and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Kip, I think you're scheduled to go at 3.30 and I have already made you a host or a co-host. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so we'll just go right on into it. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, how's everybody doing today? Good, perfect. Uh, 
My name is Kip Smith. I am with Wildlife Encounters. We are an educational wildlife refuge in Gretton, Nebraska. Uh, what we do, we provide a home for a lot of exotic animals. A lot of the animals we come from other zoos, refuges, maybe people's pets, maybe animals that people have illegally. Uh, we provide a home for them and a few of those animals become our ambassadors. And one thing we've been doing for the past 30 years is visiting a lot of the uh, libraries during the summer reading program. Uh, it's one of our favorite programs of the year. It's an awesome opportunity to give kids a chance to meet some real life animal ambassadors and then connect those to the books uh, that kids are you know super interested in uh, so what we're gonna do today guys I was actually have some animals I didn't want to just talk to you guys about what we do I kind of want to introduce you to some of our animal ambassadors uh, during at any time if you guys have any questions at all uh, feel free you can chat it in the chat bar and ask your question or also feel free to unmute yourself as well and you can talk to me directly uh, do not worry about interrupting me at all that's no problem at all if you're anything like me you have a great question and then a couple minutes later you may forget. Uh, so feel free to, to jump in at any possible time. But I'll get started with one of our animals for you guys. Uh, we kind of do a wide variety of animals here that we introduce kids to. Uh, we've seen a lot of interest with uh, you guys have probably seen yourself as well. We see a lot of some kids are extremely interested in reptile books. They pick up a lot of reptile books or they're interested in the oceans or the deserts, uh, you know, a specific habitat. So for our presentations, we usually have a lot of a different variety of different animals coming from different areas all over the planet uh, and also have different adaptations and different uh, things that we can discuss as well. Uh, our first animal I'll introduce you guys to comes from a tropical rainforest regions of South and Central America. He is one of our favorite animals. The kids absolutely love him. Uh, his name is Cyrano. Let me introduce him to you guys. During this pandemic, uh, it has been extremely difficult for Cyrano. He is super friendly. Uh, he is probably one of the most lovable animals we have, uh, but unfortunately we're not able to visit schools and things like that, but he loves attention. Uh, so for Cyrano, it's been a little more tough during this pandemic because he hasn't gotten the chance to see very many people, but he's actually learned to love virtual programs. He can see you guys right now. Uh, so if you guys actually wave to him, he can see, there you go, Sally. He'll wave back to you guys. <laughs> Do you want to wave, bud? <laughs> he loves people. So it's actually been a little difficult during this time. Uh, we still have to give him car rides. Uh, we load him up in our vehicle. We drive him around town, and then he comes back because if he doesn't really go on his car rides and see, and we have to put him put him on the seat so he can look out the window and put his kennel in the seat belt. Uh, this way he can see everything that's going on. Because if he doesn't have a good visual, he gets very cranky with us. Uh, but doing virtual things like this is just part of the enrichment program that we have set up for him. Uh, but to get started on these animals, they're a great animal to introduce to kids. Because uh, one, they wave, kids love that. They think it's hilarious, but it also brings a connection to these animals and the tropical rainforest ecosystems uh, in which we talk about. So they can see a direct result, a direct uh, uh, animal that comes from the rainforest, and we can relate that to the habitat destruction that's going on in the rainforest. But Cyrano here, he is a green-winged macaw. Uh, these are a type of parrot. They're actually one of the largest parrots in the world. They're called, the nickname, the gentle giants of the parrot world. Uh, they're very docile, very very sweet. Don't let that fool you. He wants a treat. You want a treat, bud? <laughs> they are very picky on who they let hold and work with them. Uh, Cyrano is extremely intelligent. He only lets two of us here at Wildlife Encounters work with him. He will not let anyone else touch him or anything. Uh, just like, uh, you know, with us humans, they kind of bond and they have a special bond with certain people. It takes quite a while to be able to build that up. Uh, he's young. Cyrano is probably about 14, 15 years old. Uh, we'll see a lifespan of about 60 to 80 years for these animals. And he can still fly. So you can see those big wings that he has. Do you want to show him your wings? He has those really big wings. We can see these guys fly about 20, 25 miles per hour in a single, or miles per hour, and they can fly about 30 miles in a single day. And as they're cruising around over the tropical rainforest, really, really important feature for these guys, for us humans, is that they're what we call a seed disperser. So he's eating a lot of fruits, nuts, and seeds. It's gonna sound kind of gross, but he's pooping all over the rainforest. His body doesn't digest those seeds, and he's dropping them all over the rainforest, just like what our birds do right here in Nebraska and all throughout the United States, all over the planet. They're spreading those seeds, and they're actually help growing new trees and plants, which of course, you know, as we all know as adults, we get oxygen, we get food from those, we eat bananas, avocados. Uh, if you drink coffee, all those things come from the rainforest. So animals like these, really, really important as people. Uh, he is really picky. So today I have a bunch of almonds <laughs> I'm trying to give him and walnuts, but he, oh, there we go. Now he wants them. <laughs> now he's eating them. Oh, he's spitting. Nope, he doesn't want them. He spit them back out. Uh, they're just like us people. Uh, each bird has their own favorite taste in food. He even has his own favorite taste in music, uh, what they like to do. Uh, they are highly, highly intelligent animals. 
many of these birds about the same intelligence about a two to three year old human being. Uh, so very, very intelligent animals. I actually didn't really understand the appreciate, appreciation that people had for birds until I started working with Cyrano. I was not a bird person at all, uh, but you start to see the high intelligence of these animals. Uh, they have high emotional intelligence as well, uh, just like us people. So very, very cool animals to talk about. Like we said, we'd like to bring in that educational factor as well. Uh, it's talking to kids about picking up a book and reading about either the rainforest or macaws like this. Um, Meanwhile, these animals are not an endangered species, but their relative, the scarlet macaw, they look very similar. They just have a yellow stripe down their wing. Uh, those have become an endangered species in the past decade, and that's mainly due to habitat loss. Uh, we've been tearing down a lot of trees in our forests in South and Central America, and unfortunately, cause a lot of issues in those areas. Uh, does anyone have any questions on Cyrano, the macaw? He can talk. We can see him in the talk. Do you want to say hi? Hello. <laughs> I don't know if you guys hear that. Perfect. Uh, so he can talk. Uh, he mimics us. Cyrano has a very large vocabulary. He says, hi, hello, goodbye, pretty bird. He sings the, uh, if you guys remember the old Pee Wee Herman movie, the tequila song on there, he goes, do, 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 do. Do, 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 and then he'll start dancing too. <laughs> and he sings the song. Uh, so anything, anything he can repeat, he repeats back to us, which is just absolutely hilarious to us. But it's also part of enrichment with these guys too. They like to learn new sounds, new uh, voices. Uh, we have a few birds here that will actually mimic certain sounds. We have one that mimics water. Uh, we think water is running and it's not, it's just the bird. Uh, so <laughs> some, some unique things these guys get the opportunity to do. But we'll go ahead. Will we buy to Cyrano? No, we buy bud. And then we'll grab our next animal for you. <coughs> our next animal is a very unique animal. We don't get the chance to really see these too often. Uh, their cousin comes here in Nebraska. So this animal, is, their relative comes up here from the south and it, they're not a native species, but they, they kind of kind of cruise their way through Kansas up here in Nebraska. Uh, this one is actually from South America, but this is a armadillo. So this is a three banded armadillo. They curl up in the ball when they're on their back to help protect their stomach. But you guys can see once we hold just like this, they start to stick their head out and check things out. But there are a three banded armadillo. So we see those three bands. You see one, two, three. These are the only types of armadillos that can roll into a ball. Uh, here in the States, we have nine banded armadillos. They're a lot larger. Uh, they're faster than these animals. Uh, these guys are a lot smaller, about full size for these is about three to four pounds. So they stay relatively small, but that's their defense mechanism. The way that they protect themselves is by curling into that little tiny ball just like this, and it allows them to protect them from other predators that may try to eat these guys. So a predator for this animal, uh, what we'd see in Brazil, which they're native to, uh, we would see animals like jaguars would try to eat them, so they've got to be really, really careful. Uh, so they curl up in that little tiny ball, easy way to protect themselves. They are, of course, an insectivore. So if you look at that little tiny nose, they're sticking that nose out, constantly smelling. You see that nose moving around. They're picking up bugs and insects in the ground. Extremely good sense of smell. So he's picking up those bugs on the ground, sniffing for them, and he has these giant claws. He rips up the ground, digs up the bugs, and he has an extremely long tongue that they stick down into the holes, grab the bugs, and then they eat them. Uh, some of his favorite foods are going to be things uh, like mealworms and cockroaches they like to eat, but in the wild, pretty much anything they can find. Uh, one kind of unusual thing they like to eat too are carrots. Uh, we get a lot of shredded carrots, uh, treats, things like yogurt and stuff like that too. These guys will absolutely go crazy for. Uh, but kind of a unique animal. One that we don't really get the opportunity to see here in Nebraska, like we said, we do have the nine banded armadillos as well. Uh, they are an animal that is part of what's called the SSP. It's the Species Survival Program. Uh, so we have this program in place that allows uh, zoos and uh, organizations to be able to breed these animals in captivity with the goal to release them back into the wild. Uh, it's been an extremely successful program. It's a program that not a lot of people know about, uh, kind of unless you're really interested in animals. Uh, it's worked very successfully for a great example would be the California condor or an animal that almost basically went extinct in, the, in, in California, I was actually able to bring brought back by those breeding programs. Uh, in Africa, they actually had an antelope species that went extinct, completely extinct in the wild. We had none left, but luckily there were zoos in Texas that had them. Uh, they actually bred them and they released them back into the wild. So now they have about 30 to 40 of these antelope, which were extinct, uh, but now they're actually trying to rebuild their populations. Uh, here in Nebraska, we've seen it be a successful story with the black-footed ferrets. Uh, they've done the same SSP program with those animals too. Uh, so these guys, 
or same part of that program, uh, part of those animals that they, hopefully we don't have to do this, but unfortunately, you know, we see a lot of destruction going on in rainforest regions, especially with these animals. Uh, if you remember last year, we had a lot of the rainforest in South and, or a lot of the fires in South and Central America. Uh, these were an animal that was affected by that. Their defense is to curl up. Uh, so with things like, uh, uh, fire wildfires they typically don't take off and run sometimes they curl up which ends up being a devastating effect for the populations in those areas uh but we'll go ahead we'll put this guy back uh, his name is meatball by the way uh so a lot of kids here in the nebraska area know meatball by name they're one of his favorites uh, but we'll go ahead we'll put meatball back we'll grab our next guy for a minute Our next animal is a nocturnal animal. We will see this guy be a nocturnal species. Uh, animal, of course, is coming out at night. Uh, looking for called a honey bear, uh, also called a kinkajou. Either name works for these guys. Uh, there is a story which it, it's kind of some people believe it, some people don't, but they believe this may be one of the possibilities for the, the reason of the writing of the book uh, um, Winnie the Pooh. Um, some people say it's possible because the writer had an actual bear as a pet. Some people think it might have been an actual kinkajou, uh, but the whole honey aspect of that uh, is kind of portrayed through these guys because they love sweet tasting food. Uh, honey bears, why they get the name honey bear because they love sweet tasting food, especially like bananas like this. Uh, his name is Oliver. Oliver loves bananas, grapes, any sweet type, type of food if he can possibly find. If you watch, he shoves his entire face in that banana and grabs out the food. But that is actually an important thing that they do in the wild. When he finds flowers, he becomes a pollinator. He shoves his entire face in a flower. He licks out all the nectar, Pollen attaches to his face and he pollinates fruits and vegetables all over the rainforest and flowers. So just like our bees are pollinators, same thing with these guys as well. And you'll see he'll just shove that food down. He does not, he does not waste any time and he's already had breakfast and lunch. So this is his third meal of the day. Uh, they, they do two things. They eat and they poop. Uh, these can you do, but kind of follows the same thing as the uh, macaw. They're a seed disperser, so it's extremely, extremely important. Uh, their body is has a very, very fast metabolism. You know, he eats something and it's going through his system, uh, but that's very important because his body doesn't break down the seeds, which allows for that seed dispersal. So they're spreading those seeds all over the place, all over the rainforest to help grow those fruits and vegetables. Now we said he's nocturnal. If you take a look at his eyes, he has those dark eyes. Uh, Oliver here, he wakes up during the day. He hears us, he knows something's going on. So he wakes up and checks us out because he knows he's probably gonna eat a treat or something along those lines. But at nighttime, he's really, really active. Uh, during the day, he's more calm, he's more relaxed, he wants his food, and after this, he'll be up, you know, 15 minutes, then he'll go take another nap. Uh, but at night, very, very active, extremely athletic animal. Uh, they can move and navigate through trees. They're not very well suited for life on the ground. So the armadillo, we're going to see him be a terrestrial animal. He's going to be on the ground. They're going to live, uh, those armadillos can live in a lot of different environments. We can leave them in scrub desert areas, uh, rainforest areas, even savanna and grassland areas, biomes as well. Uh, these guys primarily rainforest, and their body is really well built for a rainforest type environment. Extremely good climber. So if you take a look, he has those really sharp claws. Those claws allow him to dig into the tree branch so he can climb. He has awesome camouflage. If he's sitting on a tree, he's going to blend in really well. Oh, uh, Bellevue Public Library asked, what kind of animal is he? So he is called a kinkajou or a honey bear. Uh, they look like a primate. They're actually a uh, very similar to a raccoon. They're in what's called the Procyonidae family. Uh, so they're actually related to our raccoons here in the United States uh, or here in Nebraska. Uh, so if you've ever been to a place uh, like in, in Mexico, um, you know, like the uh, Yucatan area, they have quadrumon bees. They kind of look like this too. Those are all related to one another. Uh, so very similar related animals. So he is very close related to raccoon. But if you watch, I don't have to hold him. He hangs on with those claws. But one very unique thing these guys do is they have what's called a prehensile tail. So if you watch, he grabs on to my thumb with his tail. I don't have to hold on. He's trying to grab onto my neck. I don't have to hold on to him. He does that all himself. He's wrapping around my hand. And if my hand started to go up, if he wanted to, he can hang on if he wants to, but he's kind of just hanging out here with a banana right now. But he has that prehensile tail. He can grasp onto things with that tail to hang onto a branch to make sure he doesn't fall off. So if this banana is sticking far out from a tree, he'll take this tail and he'll hang on to a branch. He feels secure here, so he's not gonna do it. But he can hang on to a branch to make sure he's nice and protected so that branch falls. He's got a safety mechanism by using that tail to go ahead 
hang on. And he can completely hang on by that tail. He does not have to use his feet. But one cool thing, his feet have double joints in them. So this back foot has a double joint so he can spread, move it backwards too. And he can flip it all the way around. Uh, that's just another adaptation these animals have. And we usually talk to, you know, our youth, our younger kids, we kind of correlate that to um, what we're seeing, uh, wild cracks. They talk about it as a creature power. So the kinkajou's creature power, his adaptations are going to be that prehensile tail, allows him to hang on. Also, those feet, having that double joints allows him to be able to climb up or down a tree, no matter what way his body is positioned. He can be sideways, backwards, doesn't matter. He can move up and down that tree. And it helps him evade predators. Uh, he eats other animals. He's what we call an omnivore. So he'll eat mainly fruit, though. About 90% of his diet's fruit. But he'll eat some frogs, some lizards, uh, some bugs, if he gets the opportunity. But he's got to watch out because there's a lot of predators in the areas where he lives. There's big hawks and eagles that will swoop down and pick him up. We actually have an owl here at Wildlife Encounters. He's you know, huge, he would easily be able to eat this guy if they were met in the wild. Uh, so he's got to be able to watch out. So those feet flips them backwards, runs right down the tree, easy way for him to be able to escape from predators that may try to hurt him. So we see some, some unique adaptations some of these animals have to be able to survive in the, in the ecosystems and the habitats and biomes in which they live. Does anyone have any questions on Oliver, the kinkajou? He is too cute. <laughs> he is cute. Yes, I agree. He is kind of one of those cute animals. People see these guys. Uh, they kind of have that adorable face <laughs> and that kind of those cute markings on him for sure. Um, they are an animal a lot of people think are cute, but you do have to be careful with these guys. Uh, they do have really big canine teeth. Um, you know, Oliver, he's super friendly and nice. Uh, he looks that cute, adorable animal, but he is an animal like, you know, a lot of people, we always, people will say they want one as a pet. We always recommend not a good pet for these guys at all. Uh, they're, they're very rambunctious. They're destructive, uh, but you know, they, they do look cute for sure. Uh, so we see some kind of unique things for these guys. They are a common animal that we see uh, in books as well. There's actually a few books about kinkajous uh, that you guys will see too. Uh, is Kristen asked, is he the only one we have? Yes, he is the only one we have. Uh, these guys are a solitary animal. Uh, so they don't uh, need two of them to be together. Uh, in the wild, these guys will be off by themselves, cruising around, looking for food, kind of doing their own thing. There have been situations where they have seen uh, groups of kinkajous. They're what we call a cavity nester. So they'll actually find cavities, holes, and tree trunks, and they may find a few of them seeking refuge in the same area. <laughs> Uh, love the color of his fur. Yes, their fur is really cool. It's kind of, he had these different shades, but it's kind of this beautiful kind of brown and kind of like light tan color that you see. And it's very thick. Uh, I wish you guys could get the chance to, you know, kind of feel it. Uh, but if you pet him, it's, it's, it's way softer than it looks. It's extremely, extremely dense. Uh, and that helps protect them from bugs and insects that may try to hurt them. Uh, so if a bug flies down, bites him or tries to sting him, it actually protects them from that. And a lot of times with bees as well, if they grab onto a beehive, try to look out the honey, bees come out, it makes it very, very difficult for bees to sting him. So they have such dense, thick hair for these guys. And he loves smell. So if he goes in my hair, he'll start looking and doing everything he can. Uh, Jennifer asked, is the animal he rescued? Yes, um, he actually, he came from a zoo actually. So this was not a pet. Um, we actually had Cyrano came from World Bird Sanctuary. Uh, the armadillo actually came from a uh, facility in California. They are actually a part of that SSP program that we talked about. And he was an animal that they were no longer reproducing. So they wanted us to see if we wanted to have him as a ambassador educational animal here. <laughs> but he actually came from a zoo. Uh, he, they had some, some things going on, another kinkajou there. So I asked us to take care of him and we ended up getting Oliver from them. Uh, are they endangered? Uh, no, these guys are not endangered. Uh, they are not a protected animal that we see in the wild. Uh, they're actually doing quite well. Um, they're pretty, they're kind of scavengers, kind of like raccoons. So, I mean, these guys, are, they're pretty creative animals, so they will find a way to survive. So we've seen pretty good numbers of that. Of course, we've seen a lot of animals to be put at least on the endangered species list or less populations of them. Uh, but these guys, they're doing pretty well in the wild. Oh, Jen asked, where did he come from? He actually came from a zoo. Uh, I don't remember what zoo, though. I don't remember what state he came from. I'm not 100% for sure. I'd have to find that out. Uh, we've had him for a few years. So after a while, sometimes I start to forget some <laughs> where they come from. <laughs> but we'll go ahead. We'll put this guy back. Uh, we will grab our next animal for you guys, and I'll be right back. Favorites with a lot of kids in the area. Sorry, it's a little bit longer to get this guy. Here we go. 
he came from Colorado. <laughs> this is Noodle. Uh, Noodle is a boa constrictor. Uh, so Noodle here is an albino boa constrictor. Uh, we see these guys living in a tropical rainforest ecosystem as well. Uh, Crystal, she said she loves Noodle already. We get that comment a lot uh, with from kids. Uh, a snake is a great, it was one of our favorite animals to take out. And the reason being, this is an animal a lot of people fear. They don't like snakes. Uh, we even hear kids say that their parents, you know, unfortunately in the summer will try to run over their a snake in their yard with a lawnmower or try to kill it. But by bringing Noodle and introducing kids to snakes like this, it, it lessens that fear. And that's why we named Noodle Noodle. It's a funny name. People laugh when they hear it. It doesn't make him sound as ferocious as saying it's a boa constrictor. Uh, so when kids meet Noodle, a lot of times when they meet Meatball at the same time, they think it's funny to say you can get spaghetti if you mix Meatball and Noodle together, which was actually probably one of the most clever jokes I've ever heard from a third grader in my entire life <laughs> we actually use it today so i thought it was pretty good uh but noodle here he was actually someone's he was someone's pet from colorado uh he came to us and we've had noodle for probably five or six years now uh excellent ambassador animal super friendly very calm and a great animal to talk about about the benefits of snakes uh and how we can actually us humans can actually benefit from these animals um, these animals are going through, they're eating a lot of rodents, a lot of mice and rats, and helping us humans prevent those rodents from uh, spreading disease to us people. But with these animals, some cool adaptations as well. Uh, he's a constrictor, so he's biting his prey. He's non-venomous, so he bites his prey, he squeezes his prey, and then he swallows it entirely whole, so he does not use venom. Uh, we do have venomous snakes here in Nebraska. Uh, you'll see rattlesnakes and copperhead snakes and things along those lines, but nothing here in, in our area. We're in Omaha, so we don't have any of those animals here. Uh, but some really cool, you know, adaptations with their constriction method. Uh, you can see he's hanging on to me now. Uh, this is not a trying to constrict. This is just trying to make sure he's hanging on properly and he's not going to fall. Uh, he's just grabbing onto my thumb. Just to make sure he's nice and secure. And then he's kind of cruising around the back to see what's going on as well. Uh, he's also a reptile, so he's cold-blooded. He's actually way warmer than me. Uh, he was sitting under his heat lamp. Uh, so he's, you know, he's probably like 105 degrees right now. So he actually feels nice and toasty warm on me today. Uh, but we're seeing, you know, there, of course, we explain to kids uh, how these animals' body temperature changes with the temperature around them, uh, being an ectothermic, a cold-blooded animal. Uh, they're a carnivore, so he's only eating other animals. He's going after, he's eating uh, mice and rats. Uh, he'll also, in the wild, they would eat uh, certain types of boas would eat uh, bats and things like that as well if they had the opportunity to. Uh, I was actually with the University of Nebraska and we were actually studying Puerto Rican boa constrictors, which is amazing time. Uh, they actually hang upside down from caves, bats fly out, they grab onto the bat and then they eat it. So some really cool uh, kind of some opportunities that we see with these animals. Uh, they asked how much does he weigh? Uh, Noodle probably weighs, we haven't weighed him for probably a month or so. But I'd say he probably weighs maybe 16 pounds or so. He's about six, probably a little over six feet long. So I know it's a little hard to see here. I'll try to back up. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to see his full length, but it, this banner is about four feet wide. So he's probably a little less than a half feet long. Um, full size for these guys, this type of snake is usually about 10 feet long. We don't know Noodle's age. Uh, the people that had him got him from somebody else. Noodle ended up getting really, really sick with them. He had uh, what's called mites. It's kind of like lice, like what uh, you know a human or a dot would get. And he had mites all over his body. And he was really underweight. Uh, and they were really scared of him. So they ended up giving him to us. Uh, but we've had him, I think, for five years now. So he's probably at least, he's got to be at least eight years old or so. And we'll see a longer lifespan. We'll see, you know, 20 years old or so for these guys. Yeah, they are. They have beautiful markings. And like I said, he is an albino. So usually not this color. Usually we're going to see a darker coloration for these animals to be able to blend in. And camo. Being an albino, they would not generally be able to survive in the wild, or at least for very long, because uh, they would stick out. It would be hard for them to hide from their prey. It would also be very difficult uh, to be able to uh, hide from their predators as well. All right, guys. We'll go ahead. We'll put Noodle back. I've got one more animal, and then I will be right back. He is probably the most hyper animal that we have here at Wildlife Encounters. Uh, this is King Julian. Uh, King Julian. <laughs> Sally, I see it there. You know exactly what type of guy this is. Uh, 
King Julian is a ringtail lemur. Uh, these are an absolutely incredible animal to talk about. Uh, it's one that kids definitely identify with, of course, because it allows us to introduce in uh, awesome habitats that we have in Madagascar. Usually people just think of Madagascar as having one habitat, rainforest, but it actually has tons of different, tons of, lots of biodiversity in there with animals and habitats. Uh, but King Julian here, ringtail lemur, lots of different lemurs, dozens of different types of lemurs out there, but this is the most famous one. Of course, they get their name because they have the ringtail. But we have everything from pygmy lemurs, red rough lemurs, even eye eye lemurs. Those are those kind of you see them uh, kind of like scary ones. They're kind of kind of kind of look like a gremlin a little bit. They don't have that cute look to them. Uh, with some really cool features for these guys. Oh, Tammy asked, are children allowed to touch hold the animals if you do live presentations? Um, depends on the group size. So if a uh, library has uh, you know a, a group of children that will allow us to be able to do that. Yes, I think it's really important to give kids an opportunity to interact with some of the animals. Some animals are interactive, some animals are not. King Julian here is a no interactive animal. Um, they're very hyper getting him to sit. You know, he's not gonna, he just does whatever he wants to do. Um, that's just his, his attitude. He likes to jump and things like that. Uh, but we introduce animals like Noodle. Uh, alligators are a nice animal to be able to get kids interact with. We can explain and talk about the osteoderms of, an, of alligators, which are the spikes which absorb energy from the sun on their back and we give kids a chance to pet them. Uh, armadillos would be another great example of an animal that kids can get the chance to interact with. Uh, when we are fostering our baby kangaroos, which we usually do during the summer, uh, we usually call it volunteers as well during our programs to help feed the kangaroo and they're an animal that kids can get the opportunity to pet as well. Uh, but it does depend on the group size. Uh, we do some library programs. Uh, for example, when we go to uh, Saddlebrook Library in Omaha, they will have you know 200 people at that presentation. And unfortunately, just we would love to, but it's just too many people to do it. Uh, but when we do programs at uh, you know Sump Library or Bayright Library, if they have a smaller size group. That's definitely something that we can do, and we, it's a really cool opportunity for people. Um, Oh, okay. Yep. Jen, she's like King Julian. Yes, they are. They're really cool animals. Uh, beautiful eyes too. They have those beautiful kind of orange eyes. Uh, I know I'm running out of time here for you guys. I'm sure you guys have other things going on after this, but I will share what my favorite fact about lemurs. Uh, if you guys look, let's see if we can get him to reach. Oh, wrong hand, bud. He has what we call a stink gland. If you look right here, he has a bald spot. We're going to use your other hand, bud. There. Oh yeah. Come here. If you look right there, <laughs> It's fast. He has a bald spot on his wrist. Uh, lemurs have that bald spot, and there's a specific function for it. Uh, in lemur culture, the girl lemurs are in charge. They are the bosses. They need to tell the boys what to do. If they come to a group of trees, the females get to eat first. The dudes, they have to sit and they have to wait until they say it's okay. If they don't, they get in trouble. But the guys amongst their group have a really cool way to be able to show who is boss. And I think it's just absolutely incredible. It's kind of a unique thing that they do. Uh, they take that scent gland and they rub it all over their tail and they make their tail smell really really bad and then they wash their tail in front of the other lemur's face that they want to fight and whichever lemur smells the worst wins the fight so they have stink fights uh so and these don't this last you know it's not an instantaneous thing they can literally out stink each other for an hour uh so we see these really cool kind of uh cultural thing that these guys do by being they have a stink fight each other instead of biting or kicking or punching uh what we see other animals may do uh these guys are just trying to out smell one another it's kind of a, an interesting thing that we see with these guys uh oh Beverly. oh yes we did your uh your kickoff this past summer yes with the virtual thing i know yeah this kind of uh, summer was a little different with virtually what we did all of our programs. Uh, so yeah, usually we go out and we do uh, you know, in-person presentations. This summer we converted over to doing virtual programs. Uh, so hopefully this summer we'll do in-person ones, but if not, we're all set up for virtual programs as well. Uh, it was kind of a neat thing though. We got to meet people from all over the country this year. Uh, so typically not something we do, but we have programs in California and New York and Mississippi and all over the place. Uh, so kind of, kind of a unique little thing. Uh, Oh, yes. Oh, hey, Jennifer. I see you there. <laughs> hey, how's it going? <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks. I know. I thought, it, yeah, we come to uh, Jennifer's library every year, too. We've been there for, oh, yeah, years now. Uh, but like I said, library programs are probably one of our, our favorite programs that we get to do. Uh, one of our, actually, at Omaha Public Library, it was two years ago, I kind of, a photo that they took kind of really showed why we like to do this. There was, it's on our website. Uh, there was a little girl that had a stack of 10 different animal books, and she was just sitting waiting for our presentation. Uh, so it's a really cool opportunity to get to teach kids about animals, uh, and then really get them to increase to kind of focus on checking out a book about that animal we brought today, like the lemur, or even the rainforest, or whatever it may be. Uh, Tammy asked the cost for presentations. Um, it depends on where you're located. I'm not sure. Is this this is all of Nebraska, right? Or is this one specific? 
Okay. Yeah. So it kind of depends on how far we travel. Um, <laughs> you can email us at, sorry, that's Cyrano yelling now. Um, if you guys you can email us at wildlifeencounters.org. Oh, you want a banana? No? All right, try to give him a banana. <laughs> if you guys think that's loud through the microphone, <laughs> trust me, in here, it's really bad. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to shoot us an email at wildlifeencounters uh, at gmail.com or you go to our website at wildlifeencounters.org. Um, if you are a library that is further out, we're located in Gretna, Nebraska, so right outside Omaha, uh, we can actually route you guys as well. And then it's going to be a lot more cost effective than just driving straight, you know, if it's hours away and then coming back. Um, so, yeah, you can shoot us an email. I'd be happy to figure out a schedule for you uh, and do that. But yes, I know, Kirsten, you said Cyrano is jealous. He does get jealous. Uh, they just, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I went out of town once for a week and I came back. He clamped onto my hand so hard with his claws. I had to sit for 30 minutes and just pet him. Uh, they do get jealous. Uh, Cyrano lives with pickles, which is a blue and gold macaw this type of macaw and we can't take pickles out to programs unless we take Cyrano out because he gets angry. He knows what's going on. So if we grab, Cyrano has his kennel and just his kennel. No one else is allowed to use that. So if we grab one of the bird kennels, he knows pickles is going somewhere. So we actually have to put Cyrano in a kennel, put him in the van, drive him, come back, take pickles so he doesn't see, put him in his kennel, swap him, and then Cyrano can go back so he thinks he went somewhere. Uh, if we don't do that, he's mad for days. Like he actually throws temper tantrums. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's, they train us more than we train them is what I usually tell people. <laughs> so it's kind of, kind of a little crazy thing we have to do for the animals, but they're so intelligent and they have that high emotional intelligence as well uh, that you, you kind of have to play that game with them. That's just how those, those parrots are. Um, but I think I'm out of time for you guys today. Uh, do you guys have any questions about any of the animals or our presentations or anything else I can answer for you guys? No? All right, guys. Uh, well, I want to thank you guys for having us today. I had a great time talking to you guys. And uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact us. You can check us out at wildlifeencounters.org uh, or email us at wildlifeencounters at gmail or at gmail or wildlifeencounters.org or email us at wildlifeencounters at gmail.com. Uh, if you guys have any questions or anything else, feel free to give us a call or email anytime. Um, I'm going to give King, I, my hands are covered in banana, but I'm going to give the rest of these to King Julian here and put him back. Uh, Otherwise, we will see you guys around. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. And Lisa, I made you co-host. So whenever you are ready, we are ready for you. OK. Oh, my goodness. That was like the coolest thing I ever saw, all those awesome animals. <laughs> you all have to have him at your library with those, those animals. That was so cool. Okay, well, thank you, Tammy um, and everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for um, letting me share some of the great things that I know about therapy dogs um, with you all. And I know you're setting up your summer reading programs and um, <clears throat> hopefully this will encourage you to invite some of the therapy dogs <clears throat> to your program. Uh, some of you may know, I might've seen you uh, last year, I was able to come to Omaha for the Golden Sower Award, which was such an honor. Uh, my family, I grew up in Iowa, Nebraska, and my family still lives in Omaha. So that was great fun. And I saw a little bit earlier on this program, you had uh, someone from the Henry Dorley Zoo. And that was great because every time I'm in town, we always try to go. My parents have a, a um, season's pass. So it's one of our favorite places. But um, as you know, uh, Madeline Finn, the library dog, is about a struggling reader. Uh, but everything changes for her when she meets a therapy dog. The second book, uh, Madeline Finn and the Shelter Dog. Uh, Madeline Finn wants a dog all her own. Uh, but when she finds out um, how dogs and animals are at a shelter, she wants to help. And this was inspired by a friend of mine who takes her students to read to the shelter animals. So it would sort of look like that. She takes her students to read to the shelter animals every Saturday. And it's a wonderful way for the kids to, you know, find a way to help their community. They practice their reading. The animals learn to trust again. It's a lovely, lovely program. And then the newest one, which came out in September, Madeline Finn and the Therapy Dog. And in this story, 
Madeline Finn wants Star to become a therapy dog, just like Bonnie. And uh, it takes place at a retirement community. That's where uh, therapy dogs are often certified. It's a great place for dogs to show off their skills. So you're gonna learn a little bit about what it takes to become a therapy dog. Uh, but also um, she finds a new challenge there, which is the man in the corner who never smiles. And so Madeline Finn needs to find a way to reach that person, her and Star. So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit here. And if it's okay, Tammy, I'll share my screen and I can share some videos and uh, some things about setting up these programs. Let's see, I'm gonna go with this. Go ahead, and share. So I'm just gonna, you can see my PowerPoint here, like some images. Can everybody see that? Yeah, okay. Um, so this, these books were inspired by my local library. I know some of you said at the Golden Sower Awards that you have dogs at your library. Um, some of the benefits is, uh, you know, just learning to increase relaxation. The dogs, they don't judge, they don't criticize. And uh, Cricket Magazine did a, um, a, a study recently where they had children read to a teddy bear, read to a therapy dog, and then read to a parent or teacher. And then they tested them eight weeks later on their learning comprehension and vocabulary. And the children who read to the therapy dog were way ahead of the other groups. And um, they retested again in another eight weeks just to see what was, you know, to see if it was still holding true. And once again, the kids who read to a therapy dog were quite a bit more advanced. And these were struggling readers than the children who were reading to um, just a teddy bear. So I think you know, it goes to show, you know, this unconditional love that the dogs give. And I think a child just sensing that they're accepted exactly as they are, all the fear kind of just washes away. And it's a really nice um, a program to watch and see the change in the kids. Um, some of the other things that uh, the benefits is building the self-esteem. And I got to see this at my local library because I would come every Saturday when they had the Reading to Dogs program. And I would see some of the kids who were really shy in the beginning, just really come out of their shell. And one of the teachers, a first grade teacher who has a therapy dog visitor classroom on a Thursday, she says that it was so good for the kids because they knew the dog was coming on a Thursday. So they had so much motivation Tuesday and Wednesday to prepare. They wanted to practice their reading. They knew they had a time slot with the dog. And so they really looked forward to it. It was nice. And it's not just for academics. I mean, it's wonderful for struggling readers, but also uh, guidance counselors will use it for grief counseling, use therapy dogs. They'll call them in if a child's just having trouble adapting in school. Um, it's just a great thing. Uh, the dogs aren't, aren't just for learning math or learning reading. And so another thing that I did is I asked some of the kids at my local library, um, why do they like reading to the dogs? And this here that you see, that's Trevor, the dog. <laughs> uh, they said, the dogs are friendly and you can sit with them for a long time and they don't mind. And again, you do, when the child's reading to the dog, the dog has their full attention. They can spend as much time as they want with that dog, read as many stories as they want in that hour and a half time. Uh, another girl said, the dogs are so nice and I pet them and they even like the pictures. <clears throat> and that not everyone likes pictures. And it, this is true, the kids do show. Those of you who have uh, therapy dogs in your library probably have seen, they'll read a page and the kids will turn the book to make sure the dog can see the pictures. Um, another one, the dogs never make fun of you, which is really a big one. And I think for a lot of people, I, I hated to read out loud when I was young. And again, you know, reading is fun when you're not afraid of making mistakes. And so that the dogs create that learning environment. Uh, the dogs like to hear me read. And again, it's the same thing, the dogs, uh, the bond between the kids and the dogs, you know, the, the kids will come in and they'll want to read to a certain dog or some kids want to read one story to every single dog and the bonds that create there are really lovely. Um, as you probably know, all the dogs that would come into your plate, into your library are certified. Um, they go through a series of tests, and again, you'll see some of that in Madeline Finn and the therapy dog, what that process is like. But it involves really the dogs get petted, like a lot of people petting the dog at one time. 
Um, there would be a loud noise. Someone in the background will drop like a pan on the floor. And as long as the dog doesn't, you know, start barking or go crazy, you know, that's a good thing. Um, they'll go by with a wheelchair to make sure the dog doesn't want to chase it. And another big part of it is um, they have to work uh, therapy dogs often work with other dogs. So they always have an other therapy dogs at the session and the dogs will need to walk by each other without wanting to play. Um, it was really a fun thing. I got to go uh, last year, a couple of years ago with a friend whose dog was getting certified and I learned a lot about that. And for teachers, for, I asked some of the teachers and as they say, they're fostering the joy of reading. And for them, having a therapy dog in the classroom just gives them another way to reach the kids. And it just kind of makes their job easier in certain ways where they may be having trouble reaching a child. The dog just, the dog just goes right there. The dog just goes right to the heart and the kids sense that. And it makes a big difference. So I'm gonna show you um, a video here and you can see uh, some testimonials from teachers and parents and a dog named Daisy. Uh, Nora Wester is one of the groups near me. My name is Rebecca Petravich and I taught first grade last year and had Lisa, our handler, and Daisy was our therapy dog last year. And I found it very beneficial to have a therapy dog in our classroom because I had a lot of reluctant readers and beginner readers in my classroom who really helped to have Lisa there to give them help with words should they need it and just obviously Daisy to be there to give them the confidence to read and just feel good about themselves and that even if they got the simplest word correct, they could feel good about how far they've come as a reader. So I, as a teacher, from a teacher standpoint, feel that having a therapy dog in my room was incredibly beneficial to my students and obviously myself as well. Absolutely would recommend it. Um, like I said, especially with the students who struggle with reading or are uncomfortable reading orally, they found such confidence as the year went on. And that is something we really, really enjoyed seeing out of our students. And we loved seeing them feel that great about it. So Wes taught me a lot about teaching my children how to read because I know when I first started with Michael, since he was my first child, I was so focused on the pronunciation of how he was saying the word and what he was saying. But I realized after I saw him read to Wes that I just needed to relax and really just let him enjoy reading his book. My son was very apprehensive and nervous and to read in front of his peers. However, he was very relaxed and calm coming in and reading to the dog. It helped build his self-confidence and self-esteem. It was motivating to be able to get him to do his homework because when he didn't want to read, we would tell him that he would need to do it so that he could come in the next day to be prepared to read to the dog. He has come very far in his reading and it has also helped him with his writing. They, after they read to the dog, they create their own stories, build their vocabularies and read the stories to the dog. And Sean is now in third grade and has come very far with his reading thanks to the Norwester Canine Reading Program. My name is Lisa Conicella and this is my therapy dog Daisy. Daisy and I have been involved with Norwest Readers for three years. This is our third year and we have um, enjoyed the experience greatly. Daisy um, loves to come and see the children. The children are always excited to see her. We've had first grade, second grade, and third grade classes. And this year, we're with a fifth grade learning support class. We'd um, recommend volunteering with the program or any kind of therapy dog program. It's a great way to give back to the community. And in Daisy's instance, she is a rescue dog, so it's also a great way to get the word out there about all the great dogs that are looking for homes and waiting to be rescued. And if you can get one as good as Daisy, that much better. <clears throat> okay. All right. So that was... Um, a really good, uh, they're a local group and I'll show you, I'll give, I printed out their name for their, um, they have really good information on their site about starting programs. 
And then I've got another video here uh, about a dog, Pepper, who is a therapy dog in Vermont. It's not a therapy dog at my library, but a therapy dog in Vermont. And um, just to see the way the kids feel about therapy dogs too. Volunteers with Therapy Dogs of Vermont say children can improve their learning by spending time with a dog. Volunteer Beth Wadley says her special pet can raise spirits in a nursing home, but he can also help raise reading skills by visiting a school in Holland, Vermont. This dog can help struggling students prosper as he heals from his own struggles. He has been abused, he's been neglected. Um, basically he had to fend for himself uh, as far as finding food amongst the rest of the animals in the house. His second owner, Beth Wadley, makes sure he gets lots of affection. When she gets out the school supply bag, he knows he's off to see his kids. She calls him Pepper because he sneezes when he's excited. <laughs> At Holland Elementary School, Pepper enjoys a petting by kindergartners. But the dog's main purpose at school is to stay still and listen. Eugene proves that sharks are smart after all. Eugene Clark says that she is not afraid of sharks. She is too interested in them to be scared. Pepper works as a therapy dog. In a school where many students say their goal is to become a better reader, the Dalmatian helps by lending an ear. When he reached the Allegheny Mountains, he cleared a plot of land and planted a small orchard of, with a pouch of apple seeds. Fourth grader Noah Gonthier says reading anything out loud used to make him nervous. When I read the pepper, I feel calmer because it's a dog, he listens to you, and I feel calm saying the words. And so I know I get words wrong sometimes, but he listens. Pepper listens hard. Something silver glinted in the sunlight. Sometimes it looks like he's dog tired, but he's just resting his eyes. After the war, people eagered Johnny to build a house and settle down. He replied that he lived like a king in his wilderness home. Gonthier says reading to the dog is easier than reading to a teacher or a parent. He's kind of like a human because he listens, but he doesn't say like, you did this wrong or you did that wrong. Humans sometimes they will say that you got the word wrong and it sometimes makes me embarrassed and the dog doesn't. If it he doesn't get eaten up. The rest of them know it's safe for them all to jump in. Dear me, said Mrs. Popper in, in a shocked tone. They sound to me like pretty heathen birds. It's a, it's a queer thing, said Mr. Popper. Fourth grader Catherine Courier says she didn't enjoy reading aloud either until she met her canine companion. You get to pet him when you're reading, and it feels nice and soft when you're reading. Plus, he's pretty fun to sit near. So pretty soon, everybody... <laughs> Third and fourth graders sing every morning in Melanie Farrow's classroom. Pharaoh sings the praises of therapy dog sessions as confidence-building encounters for young readers. The children are able to have a very patient, non-judgmental listener. They feel like they're doing something special for another living being. I think he's a really good listener. He's calm and nonchalant and all that. Nonchalant? Yes. Wadley supervises each session. It's her willingness to volunteer eight hours a month that gives students the chance to read to their chum. The dog lends moral support. The dog doesn't laugh. The dog doesn't ridicule. The dog doesn't um, show any signs of negative behavior because they may not be strong readers. When they're reading to 
an adult, typically they're getting lots of input about how they could work on their reading. So when they have that opportunity to read to somebody who's gonna be completely non-judgmental, they're able to relax and, and, and do their best. Also, they realize they have an audience and that's very important to a struggling reader. Teachers say Gonthier's reading skills have improved since working with the dog. I do feel like a different reader because I read out loud and I feel calmer. I don't, I used to feel always nervous and stuff. And now I'm calm. I, I'm not afraid of people saying, oh, you got this word wrong. Many students say they enjoy reading for pleasure more after sharing stories with the dog. They also like to feature Pepper in writing assignments. The dog satisfies social objectives as well. Students who might be shy or students who have difficulty with peer groups, it's a great way to um, build bonds and have students feel better about themselves because there's a body here that feels good about them. The kids all enjoy reading to Pepper, but it's not just students and teachers who call the dog's visits beneficial. I can come into school and have a bad day, and when Pepper shows up, he can take all your troubles away. He's like one of my favorite dogs, <laughs> besides my own. Secretary Claudine Courier keeps Pepper's photo on her desk. He's not just a pal. Courier says the dog comforts her daughter, Catherine. Four years ago, the student would suffer when she was called on to read. She hated reading out loud. Teachers had trouble getting her to read out loud. She'd rather read in her head. And when she started reading with Pepper, it had, she just enjoyed it so much. I think it brought her out of her shyness. Now her daughter owns a shirt with a spotted pooch on it and no longer dreads reading out loud. I'm not that nervous anymore because I sometimes read to my mom a lot more and it's been a little bit better. When we first got started in, in the reading program, there was an individual who was very reluctant and actually told me that um, they were allergic to books. And uh, I said, well, you won't be when we're finished. And I received a very nice thank you card from the individual's mother because for the first time, she saw her child come home with a book to read for pleasure mm -hmm. and not because uh, the child had to for schoolwork. The kids reward Pepper with treats. Wadley says one kid rewarded Pepper with a Valentine addressed to him. She says the biggest reward that she gets is knowing that she and her dog are improving people's lives. When children come up to you and say, I don't like to read or I don't know how to read. And after a few months, they come running up with books in their hands saying, look what I can read now. This story, can I read to Pepper right now? That, that's the best reward right there. With his sad days behind him, Pepper enjoys the attention as he benefits the lives he touches. It gives me such satisfaction to know that I've made a difference, a positive difference in his quality of life, but he's also done the same for me. So it's a, it's a two-way street. We've, we've helped each other. Therapy Dogs of Vermont is an all- Oh, I should let that go, yeah. Volunteer organization. <laughs> In case you wanted to hear about that. Um, that's such a good video. It just, to me, I just love how they go into all the different things. And I could say it so many times, but to see it is really, and hear from the kid's perspective is really nice. Um, I put up this page for you, uh, just to give you some resources. Midlands Pet Therapy um, is actually local to Omaha. Uh, I looked them up and I saw that they, they visit schools and libraries and hospitals all around the local area. So they would be a really good resource if you're looking to bring a dog into your library. Uh, therapydogs.com, which is Alliance of Therapy Dogs. That's the um, organization. They're a nationwide organization. And that's the organization that um, when I went to watch uh, Beauregard get certified, it was through Alliance and um, they're really, they have a really great website, therapydoginfo.net. And then norwesterreaders.org is a good one to know because they have um, a sample, they have a section for teachers, how to request a therapy dog, like how to, if you have to say something to your, the principal or if you're at a school library and also um, a sample introductory letter to parents uh, if you're, you know, because some parents would be nervous about that, but they have a good letter that just kind of breaks everything down. 
Uh, what are we, 525? Okay, so I'm gonna stop share this for a second. Um, thanks for watching that. I would love to show a video of the real dogs from my library. It's just, uh, I think a two or three minute video if I can. Um, let's see, here we go. And share, okay. And this will also show you uh, the children reading to the shelter animals. <laughs> Okay, I'm so glad I got to show you the dogs. Those are the dogs you see in the book and those are the dogs at the library. So thank you so much. I see we have 527. So I know you've got another person coming up soon. Um, does anybody have questions? Uh, should I look in chat or you wanna unmute and just ask me anything? Anyone? Let's see. I don't know how to use the chat that well. I see there's, wait, no, wrong way, okay. Oh, there we go. What mediums do you use for your drawings? Oh, they're beautiful, thank you so much. Um, I do my sketches just with like pencil, <laughs> pencil and paper, uh, just like that. And I do um, watercolor um, and then sometimes I'll scan it in and do a little digital coloring as well. So, um, but generally I, see, I will do watercolor and pencils, my main, um, main medium for that. Uh, let's see, what else? All these very sweet thank yous. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I'm trying to think what else. Um, uh, I know you'll love having therapy dogs. You know, I was um, thinking of what some of the teachers say, you know, coming up with some ideas. Uh, do I have any ideas for my next book? I do, actually, I am working on another one. Uh, it's actually right on my table, right back there. Um, but I don't think I'm allowed to say what it's about yet. But yes, I have another one in mind for sure. Um, but you can read uh, some of these stories with the kids or have the kids read stories to the therapy dog and then write um, a little story about what their experience was like and the kids really enjoy it. Yes, it is. It's an amazingly helpful thing for children um, just to see them. I think I always come back to that same thing. Like, why do I think it works so well? And I think it's because that beauty of being accepted exactly as you are right where you are. That's like an energy that kids sense. And when they feel that it's like anything's possible and like walls just walls just come down and fear subsides and like forward momentum is just natural at that point, you know, without all the, the little fears just, and then there's just only one way to go. 
and the dogs just know how to do that. So they're, they're great helpers. Is it complicated to set up visits? I don't think so, no. Um, Midlands Pet Therapy, the one that's local, they have right on there. If you wanna visit, contact us and um, send them an email, get a conversation started. I know right now um, they're doing virtual visits, obviously, but that could still be fun. Um, there's still ways for kids to read to dogs virtually, but, and also when, as soon as they can come in again, you'll be all set. Hopefully by next summer, when your programs begin, they'll be set. And they'll bring, they'll probably bring several dogs. So it'd be a nice, and you could actually have them talk a little bit about what therapy dogs do. It would be fun for the kids to, to sit with all the animals, I think. I don't think, I don't see any other questions. Um, I think that's it. Well, thank you guys. Thank you everyone, thank Tammy and everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for sharing um, Madeline Finn with your readers. I hope it does help them. And best of luck with your, with your therapy dogs. I look forward to hearing how that goes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. And next up we have Monica from the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Monica, I already have you set up as a co-host. So whenever you're ready. All right, great. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and get started, so. Um, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission uh, here in the Lincoln office. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about uh, some of the resources that Nebraska Game and Parks has to offer libraries. Um, we've worked with a lot of libraries, um, especially in the northeastern part of Nebraska and like the Omaha Falls City area, southeast district too. Um, so I'm really excited to share some of these with you. Um, one thing I do want to um, say at the beginning too is that all of our resources are free. We are a state agency, we're a public agency. Um, so if you see some of these and are like, oh, I would really like that for my library, I don't think we can afford it, or I don't wanna work on getting the money for that, everything's free for us. So kind of just kind of keep that in mind. So, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, make sure I don't share anything embarrassing here, but um, all right. So, um, Maybe for some reason my screen does not like. All right. All right, so here's some of our program offerings. Um, I'm just gonna go through these here. I got some stuff to hold up. Usually when I do this presentation, I have like physical things to show you. So I will try and do my best to hold them up to the camera. Um, if you can't see them, please let me know. All right, so a little bit about just Nebraska Game and Parks. Um, a lot of people, even myself, before I started working here, I thought the only thing that Nebraska Game and Parks did was hunting and fishing. Um, that is a lot of what we do. Um, that is how we make our money. That is how we pay for people like my salary, my boss's salary, my coworker's salaries. A lot of that is how we pay for our things. Um, but um, if anyone's familiar with hunting and fishing, it's going down. Um, there are a lot of our constituents, a lot of our hunters are, are aging out. Um, there's just simply not an interest anymore in a lot of that. Um, so that's not strictly what we do. We do a lot of ecological education as well. Um, so it's a lot more than just teaching students about the environment and teaching the public about the environment. It's thinking about patterns and the principles of ecology and kind of understanding how science works in general. So um, a lot of people think we just go hunting and fishing. There's a lot more behind that. Why do we fish where we do? Why do we have those permits and seasons? Um, do you think this would be a good place to go bird watching? What am I going to go see when I go bird watching? How do I go bird watching? What do I do? So um, we're getting into a lot more of those things. And um, we have a whole new division now at Game and Parks um, called the Fish and Wildlife Education Division, which is the first division um, in a state agency in the country that is solely devoted to ecological education. So it's very exciting that we have that. And I'm really excited to share some of these resources with you guys. So one of the first things, a little bit more formal of a thing that we do um, are educator workshops. So these again are free. Um, I'm also the Project Wild State Coordinator. So Project Wild is a national program. It started back in the 80s as a way to get kids outside, um, but also for teachers to meet those state standards and those learning objectives, um, while also learning about things like wildlife and wildlife management and pollinators and um, 
food webs and outdoor recreation and all of those really cool topics, um, but still meeting those state standards and um, being able to use them in formal and or informal classrooms as well. So um, one of the things that we do are Project Wild workshops. So um, within the United States, we have 50, um, supposed to have 50 coordinators. I think two of them are, um, are absent right now. Um, so we have um, a state coordinator supposedly in every state. Um, so I am the state coordinator for Nebraska um, for Project Wild. So one of the things that we could do is we could always do more kind of a, a formal training. So this would be us either most likely virtual, um, coming into your location and doing a hands-on um, virtual workshop. Um, so when you guys would finish, you would get these two curriculum guides. And then the goal is that you would use those um, activities that we've done over Zoom or in face-to-face -face, um, and in the book, and then use them with your students, with your life. Library. So we can't be everywhere at once. So we would love to train you guys um, to be able to go do that on your own. So um, if you were to do a Project Wild workshop, they're very thick. Um, they're very cool books, but there are K through 12 activities in here. Um, like I said, for formal and informal educators, uh, talking about everything from wildlife and wildlife management and food webs and colors and adaptations and all of those different things mostly relating to science, but they are interdisciplinary. So you're getting social studies, you're getting science, you're getting math, you're getting environmental education, language arts, English, all of these different subjects is, um, focusing in on this Project Wild. So all of those different cool things, but still talking about wildlife and management and all of those different things I've talked about. Um, you also, there's a Project Wild and Aquatic Wild. So very similar to uh, Project Wild, but Aquatic Wild is focusing on water and our water resources and watersheds and sea turtles. And again, it's a national program. So some of the things might not be relative to us here in Nebraska, like sea turtles and manatees and tide pools, um, but we do have turtles. We do have aquatic resources. We have a ton of wetlands in Nebraska. So, and in fifth grade, that's a huge, um, in Nebraska, that's a, that's a state standard is talking about wetlands. So we can always do a training. They're usually, the Project Wild and Aquatic Wild ones are usually about three hours. Um, we would usually break them up into two different nights um, and um, have you guys do the activities from those guides to get you excited and to build that confidence for you to, to take them and then use them for your students or your library. So that is something that we do offer. Um, Growing Up Wild is something that has stemmed from Project Wild. Uh, Project Wild was very popular, so they decided to make a younger version. Um, this is the three through seven-year-old uh, workshop. So the book is a little different. It's very long and big, um, but it's colorful. It has really awesome activities. There's over 27 hands-on activities in here, but I'd probably say there's more closer to 100. Um, every activity has miniature activities within the larger activity. So. Um, going to be talking about the same things. We're going to be talking about wildlife and food webs and making observations and being out in nature and how do you know if something is alive or not alive or is it a mammal? Does it have fur on it? Um, but also incorporating things like art and music and science and math and reading. So um, but for that very, very younger age level group, so three through seven year old. So um, it also teaches things like um, the emotional, social, cognitive skills as well. Um, talking about building language, taking turns, um, how do you feel about something, using your senses. So there's lots of different things that Growing Up Wild and Project Wild encompasses. So again, these are all free workshops. We would just have to set something up with your either your library or this group, whatever you guys were kind of thinking, or if you would be interested in doing that, we can certainly um, have that happen as well. We also have something called Flying Wild, um, which is very similar to uh, Project Wild, but it is a middle school based curriculum guide and it's all about birds. So talking about um, adaptations and migrations and um, birds, um, how they move, how they eat, how they build themselves within the food web of Nebraska. So um, this is all about birds. It is probably a middle school activity guide, um, but I would not let that hinder you um, in doing this workshop either. So I've had uh, elementary school teachers and high school teachers take this workshop and they find it very helpful as well. So again, a free workshop that we do offer. Uh, something else that we've also done, um, if you are not 
really interested in Project Wild, Growing Up Wild, Flying Wild, any of those, we can build our own workshop. We have a lot of flexibility here at Gaiman Parks. Um, so it's kind of whatever people would want us to come talk about. If you're really interested in predators, we've done a predator workshop before. We've done just a simply amphibian workshop or a tall grass prairie workshop, a pollinator, bat, citizen science. Um, these are just some of them that we've done. Um, insects, all of these different things. And we can build a workshop um, around what your interests are or for your group's interests. So we want to be able to have you um, have lessons and activities uh, to teach students and teach other people. So we are welcome to come in and help you guys do that. All right, that is in the wrong spot. <laughs> um, but we will go ahead and talk about it. Um, one of the things that we also do at Gaiman Parks, um, especially this might coincide with your summer reading programs is um, in May, um, it's what we call a migratory bird month. So um, we actually use a proclamation. We request a proclama proclamation from the governor um, stating that May is International Migratory Bird Month. Um, so in Nebraska, what we will do is we will um, have different events. We have a challenge. Um, if you're familiar with something called iNaturalist, it is a free app um, that you can download on your phone. And if you take a picture of something, it will record your location and it will become a research grade um, observation. So if you find a flower and you're like, wow, that's a really pretty flower. I have no idea what it is. Take a photo of it, upload it to this app. Someone in the world will be like, oh, that's a blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what it does is it ultimately helps out scientists figure out what's around their community and what's in their community. So um, we call it a citizen science program. So getting average people out there making scientific discoveries and scientific observation. So one of the things I do want to show you um, through that is what we call Nebraska Bird Month. So I think I will have to stop sharing my screen and reshare um, this bird month. So we have this bird month site. Are you guys seeing the bird month site? Hopefully. Nope. There we go. Hopefully that's what you see now. All right, so one of the things that we do um, is this is our website. We have not updated it yet for 2021 as it is in May and we're still in 2020 right now. Um, but we have lots of events um, that people can do. Um, any organization, if you guys have a bird related event. Um, if you're simply reading a bird book and doing an activity, that's a bird related event. We can post it on our website um, and people can go to that and figure out different bird events throughout the month of May um, in the state of Nebraska. Um, we also have things like resources and downloadable printable things. We have that 2020 challenge like I talked about earlier that has that iNaturalist app on it where if you don't know something, you take a photo, you upload it and you can figure it out. Um, this last year, we worked with uh, the Nebraska Entertainment Television or Education Television. And what we did was if you participated in our challenge, you uploaded a photo of a bird in Nebraska, we sent you, no matter who you were, we sent you a, um, a magazine about birds, some pamphlets and information, and then a bird journal. So the idea was that we wanted to get people outside seeing birds, understanding birds, and then thank you for participating. Here's some bird resources that now you can take and um, go do some more bird activity. So um, we will most likely do that again this year as well. So um, we have bird month, with, which is in May. And then we have pollinator week, which is in June. So um, it's a little bit different of a time, but um, it is just a, simply a week. So this year it's June 21st through the 27th. Very similar to Bird Month. We have our own website. We have virtual events. We have a Pollinator Week challenge. Very, very similar to the Bird Month challenge, except when you participate in that, we will send you pollinator resources. So again, these could be large scale events, um, like a huge Zoom webinar, or they can be very small scale events, like you simply read a book about pollinators and then do a very simple activity or you talk about pollinators. So we want to show the public in our constituents that we have tons of resources on pollinators and just get that idea about pollinators out there. Um, so we were more than welcome to put stuff on our website and we have a submit your event here. So you would just click that, fill it out for your library or for your organization and then we will put it on our website. So um, we wanna work with, with a lot of different organizations to get that um, information out about birds and pollinators. So 
All right, we'll go back to my screen. Okay. All right, so some different physical things that we can send you or you can request as well. We have something called trail tales. So um, trail tales is something that's been going on since Oh gosh, maybe like the 80s, um, 89, um, I think 87, 89, something like that. Um, if you are familiar with our Nebraska Land magazine, um, which is a publication of Nebraska Game and Parks, um, this is the younger version. It's called Trail Tales. So this is specifically written for about a fourth grade level, um, but it has different articles in it all about natural resources. So we talk about animal adaptations, habitats, ecosystems, um, outdoor shooting sports, or um, different like how to go camping backpacking anything that you could possibly think about we have four issues every single year they go out to every fourth grader in nebraska so that's about thirty-four thousand trail tales will go out and each student will get a winter spring summer and fall issue um, for them to take home with them and keep uh, so um, the idea is that we want to teach them about all these different cool natural resources and different topics that are happening within the state of nebraska um, here's a few that I've had from different past issues. Um, so when you open up one of them, for instance, our fish anatomy, um, it is very uh, written at about that fourth grade level. Um, lots of photos, lots of graphics um, for a fourth grader. Um, but that does not mean that adults can't enjoy them too. We have lots of adults that like them um, because it's a little simpler read than for instance, a scientific journal or something like that. So um, very, very cool things um, that we have. And these are free. Um, what we will do is if you guys request them, we can send you, and I'm not kidding, we have boxes of them that we would love to send them to you. You can pass them out at your libraries um, and you can use them or um, you specifically look at those articles and, and talk about those things in those articles. So um, each one of them at the very back has like a crossword puzzle and some cool phonology about what's happening in Nebraska during that specific time. Uh, for instance, in March, a great idea is to go see the cranes, um, those kind of things. So what's happening in our state that you can physically go out and see. All right. We also have um, what's called the biodiversity poster set. Um, I don't have any to show you where we're getting them reprinted because we ran out of them, um, but they are very nice large posters. Um, they're colored posters that have what we call the top 25 um, in each category. So we have a bird, a mammals, a reptiles, amphibians, plants, threatened and endangered species, insects, and fish. So the top 25 animals that represent mammals, the top 25 animals that represent birds in the state of Nebraska. And that is on the one side. And then when you flip it over, every single animal that is on the front of that poster has a little tiny tidbit of information. What is the animal? Where are you going to find it? And then some quick facts about those animals. So um, as soon as we get those in, they are ready. They should be here by the end of the year. So, um, but they're very nice posters because they specifically relate to Nebraska. Um, we're the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, and to me, you are more likely to walk out your door and see a meadowlark or a cicada rather than a polar bear or a giraffe. Not those things aren't important, but we really want to highlight what we have here in our state, and, and we have really cool things in our state, So, um, and we have a really good biodiversity or variety of life. All right, uh, something else that uh, teachers or, or um, library programs can also request are what we call Nebraska Tracks Matching Game. Uh, so we have two different things that we can give you guys here. Um, this deck of cards, um, it will have a picture of an animal on it, and then there will be the front foot and the back foot. And so it's a matching game. So if you're like, well, I, I don't know what a beaver looks like. Um, we have our answer key for you here as well. So they're kind of a two part set. Um, it shows a picture of the animal, the front foot, the back foot, and then a little tidbit about the animal as well. Um, this is everything from mammals, there's birds, there's snapping turtles in here. Um, any really common tracks that you would hopefully find within the state of Nebraska. And again, these are all free if you guys would like 50 of them or 20 of them, um, let us know. We want to get the word out about natural resources and we are more than likely and willing to give you um, these resources too. All right, uh, something else that we have um, also been doing is what we call our ology magazines. Um, they're very similar to trail tales, 
but they are focused on a specific topic. Um, so we started this by doing uh, birdology. I know that's not the correct term or it's ornithology, but birdology sounds fun. Um, so we have a birdology magazine where um, specific bird articles and then each article has an activity that goes along with it. So these are very similar magazines. Um, I worked on the amphibian and reptile one. This one's a little different because it's a two-parter, um, but very similar to our trail tales. Um, we talk about this one says surviving danger. So how do snakes and reptiles um, protect themselves? And then for instance, on this one, we have a matching. Can you find the difference between these two photos? Um, so we have, um, right now we have a birdology and a reptilology. Um, mammalogy is currently being printed. And then we hope to have a wetlandology coming here in 2021. So very similar to trail tales, um, but they're also very fun to do. And about that fourth, fifth grade level as well. All right, so just some other resources that uh, libraries have used in the past. We have education trunks and kits that are free to check out. Um, within the state of Nebraska, we have nine different locations um, where you can hopefully get to close um, to a um, education trunk or a kit. So um, they're hands-on physical things. They're actual big toolboxes, rolling toolboxes that have about $2,000 worth of physical hands-on stuff. Um, so like our mammal trunk here, you can see we have skulls, we have pelts, we have rubber tracks, we have rubber scat, we have uh, literature books that deal with mammals or birds or prairies or whatever the topic is. Um, here's a list of all of them that we have currently. Um, not every location in the state of Nebraska has every single trunk, um, but being in the eastern part of Nebraska here, if you go up to northeast Nebraska, Norfolk is going to be your closest one, or Omaha or Lincoln has all of these trunks. If you're interested in checking out a trunk, um, you can look at our website, which I can give you here at the end too. Um, and so you would just call this number and just say, hey, is the mammal trunk available for June 15th through June 21st? Yep, it is available in Lincoln. You come to Lincoln office, you grab it, you use it, you bring it back. That's all. No deposit, no payment, no nothing. We want you to use these things. And these are really fun hands-on resources. So um, especially with the whole COVID situation too, um, we have been cleaning them. So they're sterile. We let them sit for four days. We clean everything with Lysol. We let it sit for four days and then we check them out. So um, it, depending on how the summer goes, um, but that's probably gonna be our checkout process again too. All right, if you are feeling brave, we also have a Nebraska outdoor trailer. We have three of these within the state of Nebraska. Um, it's a physical six foot by 10 foot trailer that you would need a large truck or a large SUV to pull, um, but it has everything that you would need to do a larger um, festival or an event or something like that. So we have ready to go um, plastic totes that have the name of the activity on it and then everything you need in that tote to do that activity. Um, for instance, one of the activities that we have in there is seed ball planting. So we have a bag of seeds, we have some dirt, we have a little teaspoon, we have the directions in there. Everything that you need to do that activity is in there. So when you open the trailer, there's shelves, there's tables, um, we have event signs like the stakes that you put in the ground, we have registration, um, we have duct tape, everything that you would need to do a larger festival. We just don't have the volunteers. Um, that would be on whoever um, would check out the trailer or the organization that would check it out. Um, that's kind of up to you on your end. We just provide all the supplies for you. So um, to check these out, we have one of them in North Platte, Lincoln and Norfolk. So um, same number that you would call for the trunks, you would give a call for the trailers and just same thing. Hey, is this available for this week in October? Yep, it's available. Okay, I check it out. You come get it and then you take it, you use it and you bring it back. Again, no deposit, no payment, no nothing. They are free. All right, some online resources that you guys can use, um, something called Project Beak. This was a uh, website designed from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Nebraska Game and Parks. We have fifth through eighth grade bird education. We have um, scientifically accurate information. We have games and puzzles and interactive quizzes. There's also, uh, I think, about 15 different activities that you can download and use. And again, everything that you need to do that project or that um, 
activity is right there. You print it off, you use it, you cut it out maybe, or there's data that you can use. Whatever is needed, it is all there for you. It's just simply projectbeak.org. We also have Nebraska Bird Library. Um, this is basically an interactive online field guide for Nebraska. You can search by the common name of the animal, by the characteristics, by county. Um, is it larger than a crow or bigger than a robin? You can search all of that. And then it's gonna say, okay, well, within your area, here's the six birds that it could probably be. Is this anything that you saw? And yep, it was a metal arc. I click on that and here's some information about the metal arc. All right, we also have a threatened and endangered species. Um, we used to have a website, but it is now part of Nebraska Game and Parks' website. Um, on here, there are downloadable free lesson plans and activities that you can use, all talking about Nebraska endangered species and threatened species. It also will give you little boxes like this. You just click on them um, and it gives you a bunch of information about okay, what's the Salt Creek tiger beetle? Where can it be found? What can I do to help? Why is it endangered? Um, what's it look like? How big is it? All those different things that you would want to know, they are right there for you. All right, we also have been doing some programming. Um, it just kind of depends. I mean, no one knows really knows what's going to happen here. Um, is it going to be virtual? It could be face to face um, this summer. No one really knows. At this point, we are planning for virtual, um, but that could certainly change as well. So um, if you are interested in doing a program um, with us, a virtual program or face to face, um, we something like owl pellets um, have been very popular with library programs. I've done a ton of owl pellet programs or live animals. We've done some of those as well. We have some education animals here at Game and Parks. You can probably see my snapping turtle going nuts back here. That's one of them. We have some snakes, we have some salamanders, frogs, toads, turtles. Um, but we also do things like uh, Nebraska mammals where we bring in skulls and pelts and talk about the differences between mammals and their teeth and their fur and where they live and all of those different things. So um, we're pretty flexible and we can um, uh, work with your group and, and the age level and everything as well. All right, that was a lot of information, I know. Um, but does anyone have any questions? I know I saw some, some light ups in the chat. Um, I just couldn't quite get there when I was talking. So um, trailers are awesome, yes. All right, I guess the one was just a private message and trailers are really cool. So um, does anyone have any questions or anything? Um, like Lisa talked about earlier, you guys can unmute yourself. You can certainly put it in the chat box. Um, anyone have any questions about things that Game and Parks offers or anything that we kind of talked about tonight or, or anything, so. I talk fast, I know I do, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You must have answered all of the questions. For that, or they are just so overwhelmed at all the information, yes. <laughs> well, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, or if you are like, wow, those posters are really cool. I'd, I'd like to get a set of those. Let me know. Um, uh, and we can send it to you. So um, I will also put in our website. Um, it's nebraskaprojectwild.org. Um, that has a lot of different lesson plans and downloadable things as well. And that also has information on trunks and trailers and who to contact and how to get a hold of people. Um, if you can't find anything, just email me and I can direct you to that too. So. Oh, I see someone said they have used the endangered species info before and it was very helpful. Great, I'm glad. So if anyone wants any of the magazines or posters, they can just email you. Yes, yeah, just let me know. Hey, I was really interested in the birdology ones. Can I get 50 of those? Here's my address. So um, just what you would like and, and how many. So that would be great. And we can get them sent out to you tomorrow if you, if you want them, so. All, All right. right, awesome information. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, thank you very much, Tammy. Does anybody else have any questions? If 
If not, I think that's a wrap for the day. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Yes, thanks everybody.